Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in to a special episode of the Edge Podcast. I recently had the privilege to attend the annual Ethereum Denver Conference, which is one of the biggest Ethereum developer conferences of the year, and is now so big that it has grown to attract builders and investors from adjacent builder communities such as Cosmos, Solana, and Avalanche. During my three days at ETH Denver, ZK Sync was kind enough to host me in their beautifully designed convention booth called the ZK Proof Aquarium. Most of these interviews lasted just 10 to 15 minutes, and given how many we recorded, I've labeled each interview as a chapter, including the guest protocol and a brief description of what we discussed. You can skip around the chapters on YouTube or in the podcast description to find what's most interesting to you. Now, before we get started, here's a few of the sponsors we're very grateful to have, which make it possible for us to continue producing the Edge podcast. Introducing the Mantle Liquid Staking Protocol, Mantle LSP, a permissionless, non-custodial ETH liquid staking protocol deployed on Ethereum L1 and governed by Mantle. With Mantle LSP, users can stake ETH to instantly receive ME, earn yield and accumulate rewards the longer you stake. ETH is the value accumulating receipt token that will give you access to expanded yield opportunities. Stake and watch your yield grow with Mantle LSP. Introducing RSweeth by Swell Network, a native liquid restaking token that gives you access to the Eigenlayer ecosystem. Earn pearls, points, and future restaking rewards without locking your liquidity. And enjoy countless DeFi integrations for earning easy passive yield. Learn more at swellnetwork.io. Introducing KelpDAO, the first liquid restaking platform for LSTs. With Kelp, anyone can deposit Steth by Lido, ETHX by Stator, or SFRX ETH by Frax, and mint a liquid restaking token called RSE. With RSE, you can participate in your favorite DeFi platforms and get 100% of all Eigenlayer points plus Kelp miles. A fresh wave of restaking is here, restaking that's liquid, rewarding, and convenient. Learn more today at kelpdao.xyz slash restake. It all started so simply with CryptoKitties and Maker on Ethereum, but quickly became complex with more applications and many chains. Today, everyone agrees UX issues are the biggest blocker standing in the way of crypto adoption. Introducing Avocado. Multi-chain UX redesigned from the ground up. The first wallet to abstract networks, accounts, and gas. One gas tank to pay transaction fees on all chains in USDC. And native access to Instadap's powerful, custom DeFi strategies. Avocado, one wallet to rule all chains. Hey everyone, I'm DeFi Dad. We're here at ETH Denver at the ZK Proof Aquarium booth. Uh, we are recording a live episode of the Edge podcast here with Amir, who is the uh, co-founder of Puffer Labs, which is the team behind Puffer Finance, uh, one of the top liquid restaking protocols that's launched here uh, just in the past few months. Uh, and so, yeah, I'm really excited just to kind of break down some of these really complicated topics within liquid restaking. So why don't we start with, can you just tell us a bit more about Puffer? Like there's a lot of ETH. That's been restaked there. And uh, I guess, like, what is the mission behind Puffer? Absolutely. Like, in short, Puffer would like to be the decentralization runway for Ethereum. That's the shortest explanation to Puffer. But if you want to dive a little deeper, Puffer is a native liquid restaking platform that enables permissionless validator operation. At the same time, this restaking uh, feature would increase the validator's total revenue, which makes it more viable to run Ethereum nodes. The more Ethereum nodes that can be run from home, the more decentralized the network can get. And that's what Puffer's mission is. Amir, can you remind us, you know, being so early uh, in the roadmap of Eigenlayer and Puffer, in the future, we're going to have these actively validated services, AVSs. So like once Eigenlayer's fully alive, what is that going to mean for Puff ETH? Like if I'm holding that in the future, 
Um, like, what am I exposed to? And, and like, how does that all fit into Eigenlayer and the sort of services that they're providing? Absolutely. As a native liquid restaking platform, it means the ETH that is staked on the Ethereum L1 is delegated to secure other applications, which are called ABSs. Therefore, the users that stake their ETH at Puffer are now exposed to also the revenue and the rewards generated by those ABSs, plus the rewards that is generated from Ethereum to from stake itself. That's in short, that's how it looks. How about, what are some common ABSs you envision, like in the future, XL2 or X chain, whatever, will use Eigenlayer for this and ultimately then again, like we'll be able to benefit as those that are like restaking ETH through Puffy. So I don't know if you can just give a few simple examples. Of, of yeah. course. Yeah. The, the simplest examples are the infrastructures that are securing the Ethereum itself or running on the side of the Ethereum itself, including all the L2s. Like basically anything that involves sequencer, like which is, are, which are the L2s are, can be secured by Eigenlayer and it can be an ABS. Along with that, bridges can also can be ABSs. They can have economic security securing them. Plus, there are other applications uh, like oracles and other infrastructure that can also become an ABS. These are, I think, the focuses of what ABSs should be in the future in terms of like being secured by economic security. So we live in a world where we, we talk about LRTs and LSTs. Uh, what do you think of the idea that LRTs are really just the next evolution of LSTs. I guess, like, do you envision some of these legacy LSTs continuing to operate the way that they do, where it's it's you know it's just that liquid staking at the at the base layer versus all that's going to go under the hood here with Puffy? I guess as like a newcomer to the sector, and you know you have warm relationships I know with some of these protocols. Like, how do how do you envision the future? Is is LRTs is like is that the Will that be the only you know, thing that we use to to uh, get our yield with, with, with? Of course, I think that's the comfort level and level of risk that is going to guide that a lot. So right now, there is a lot of unknowns about what LRTs are going to be. So therefore, there is like a higher risk taste for users. So the, I would say in a shorter term, LSDs would be out here because the only risk that they're exposed to really is just Ethereum proof of stake and Ethereum's beacon chain. Beyond that, once we start onboarding ABSs and other features, it means basically extra risk. And therefore, as users are going to get more comfortable with it, I would envision LRT becoming the next evolution of our existing LSTs. Because as you might have known, LSTs were also not really highly adopted to begin with. But as users got more comfortable, they were de-risked they were adopted further. Given that LRTs are going to naturally generate more rewards, it would be a natural progression to also like moving everything eventually to an LRT. Assuming that there will eventually be a massive slashing of that, like some, something large enough, let's say on the order of hundreds of millions, if not a billion dollars um, of the, with, with an AVS in the future, I guess, like, how are you as Puffer planning ahead for that? Like, how do you design and think ahead? Because, again, it's just a reality. It's it's whether it happens, hopefully it doesn't happen with Puffer, but, like, it's going to happen, you know, to one of these protocols that is exposed to an AVS that's earning, hopefully, a substantially higher yield that's higher risk. Um, yeah, how do you think about that for us as, like, end users? At Puffer, we started by wanting to reduce the risk of running like Ethereum validators. That's where we introduced the anti-slashers to the Ethereum ecosystem. There were other researches that we did that also, and products that also reduce the risks of LSTs in general. And that would be our focus also on LRTs and adoption of LRTs as well. Um, this really comes from, first, LRT is gonna, an LRT platform is really a platform that kind of decides where users should restage there to, towards an ABS. So an LRT platform has to be careful to first onboard the ABSs that their slashing risks are very known and they have very known parameters around what would, in case of a slashing, what would happen to the total E that is staked at this platform. So at Puffer, we're actually doing this sort of vetting on a DAO level and subcommittee level. 
aliases themselves are going to have different risk associated with them. Um, an internal risk that can be mitigated, like two anti-slashers, we call them endogenous risks. These are, for example, L2s, sequencers, bridges, very known amount of risk. Basically, we can expect that if a sequencer, let's say, censors a user's transaction, they are going to get slashed. Very simple. There are other aliases that are going to have much bigger risk states. Like, let's say if someone do, does an Aave as their AVS, that the slashing rule is if your price of your token versus the other token drops low. That's an exogenous risk. That is out of a protocol, like basically defense. That is out of the control of even the user itself. It's just decided by the market. At Puffer, we would be very conservative in onboarding those types that are going to have very high level of slash and risk. Therefore, we're going to start onboarding the infrastructure more uh, the aliases that have endogenous risk that we can control or we can also build anti-slashers for. But in the worst case scenario, that also that layer fails. Currently, the way that slashing works on Agen layer is quite different than Ethereum slashing. Today, if there is a mass slashing event on Ethereum chain itself, at proof of stake, there is the social consensus. The social consensus can decide, hey, there was a big mistake, let's say, in this consensus client or an execution client. There was a big bug. It was nobody's fault. Let's fork the Ethereum. It might force the Ethereum chain to be forked to actually fix this. ABS is slashing. It is an ever-evolving landscape right now, and it's been actively designed. But currently, those slash ones, the, basically, their destiny is decided by a commi slashing committee. Slashing committee can be our social layer as well. If let's say that slashing committee is very effective and has a bad effect on the chain as well, and there was due to a bug or maybe not a, like a mis like malicious behavior, the social consensus of that slashing committee can decide what happens to it. So really, all of these aspects have been already thought about in terms of like worst case scenario and worst outcome of these things that how it would, uh, turn out to be. I have one last question for you. Uh, maybe we can wrap up on uh, what's the latest on this, uh, the crunchy carrot campaign. You've been in this pre mainnet launch. So it's, it's important to distinguish puffer is not at full mainnet launch. And so I guess like what else is coming or what else can you share? And like, what can we expect once puffer is at full mainnet launch? Of course. So the focus of the crunchy carrot campaign was actually reduce the dominance of one of the biggest LSD in the industry. We wanted to actually keep. Um, Lido at less than 33% total ETH state. And therefore, right now, we're accepting SDE into the crunchy carrot campaign. The goal was to actually create a liquid receipt for users' participation in this campaign, which was eventually Puffy. So the APR of the state is being tracked by the Puffy token, and it is actually very liquid and can be traded by other platforms or the users. Upon launching mainnet, we're actually going to we draw these SCE from Lido, and therefore we draw their Ethereum validators. <laughs> Getting the ETH back and allocating the ETH that we have to the permissionless and decentralized node operators of Puffer itself, which itself would just bootstrap the Puffer uh, validators themselves and also would just start uh, the decentralization of Well, if folks want to learn more about Puffer, they can go to puffer.fi and then would highly recommend, uh, we just did an episode of, well, about a, 30, 40 minute episode of the Edge podcast. So if you go to Linktree slash Edge underscore pod, you can learn more there. And um, otherwise, Amir, just like great to see you. So uh, we're really grateful. I get to finally meet in person uh, Mike Siligadza, who is the, the founder or co founder of EtherFi. And we've got Billy Welch, who is the co founder of Term Finance. So it, it's wild because I, I already said this before we got started. I, I've known you guys now for, I've known Mike for at least a year. I've known Billy for a few years. Um, and full disclosure, I'm an investor in both term finance and EtherFi. So it, it's just a real pleasure to finally get to hang out with you guys in person. Um, this is a special ETH Denver because I think we've, we've come through a pretty brutal bear market. You know, we've, we've clearly finished it off and, and moved on to, uh, happier times. The, the, the momentum has clearly shifted. So um, we're going to talk a little bit today about what that means for 
the long-term builders uh, like yourselves that have been building for liquid restaking and um, on-chain fixed lending. So uh, why don't we start with just uh, quick intros? Uh, Mike, can you, t- can you tell folks more about what you're building at EtherFi? What is liquid restaking? Yeah, it's a, it's a very abstract product. I feel like I have to explain three layers of crypto uh, to explain what, what we do. Um, but yeah, so EtherFi is it's a new uh, next generation liquid staking protocol on Ethereum. There's two things that make it unique. The first is that it's the only staking protocol where stakers control their keys, which means it's it's truly self uh, self custodial. And then the second thing is that it is natively restaked. So uh, restaking is basically a way of reusing SIGD to provide security to other validated services, thereby taking some additional risk, but in exchange for additional yield. Uh, a more abstract way to describe that is that it's you can think of it as like a programmable consensus layer, uh, which is really quite powerful and, and exciting. And I, I believe restaking is the biggest thing in Ethereum since Ethereum. Uh, we launched our liquid restaking token in November. We're up to, I think last I checked, 1.8 or 1.9 billion in TBL. Just keeps going uh, up. Yeah, it's it's completely insane. Uh, I've never experienced anything like this in my life, uh, but it's been super fun. Yeah, well, congrats on that. It's no uh, small milestone that you guys have, have reached there. Uh, and uh, for what it's worth, I, I would still swear that Mike is one of only two people in the world other than Sri Ram who can explain to me what is Eigenlayer in, in detail. So, uh, Billy, can you share more about Term Finance and what you all have been building? Yeah, so Term Finance is a fixed rate borrow lend protocol where borrowers can pledge assets like LRTs as collateral and borrow things like ETH or stable coins to essentially get capital efficiency on great products like ETH buys wrapped in ETH. You know, the great thing about term is borrowers are able to lock in a fixed rate. There's really great DeFi protocols like Aave and Compound that allow borrowers and lenders to borrow and lend on variable rates, but that can get very uncomfortable, particularly in bull markets where on Aave, the rate and intraday goes from five to 23%. Whereas on term, you can lock in a fixed rate of capital and get the capital efficiency to unlock those staking yields, but borrow in a comfortable position without being exposed to market volatility. Yeah, so every week, Term runs these on-chain auctions. And like I, I went there recently with my own EE, and I was able to deposit that as collateral. And then what I have to do is bid uh, how much am I willing to pay in terms of our own interest. Um, it's a really interesting mechanism. I, I would really recommend folks watch... Uh, we did an episode of the Edge podcast quite a while ago on it, but if you go to DeFiDad.com, you can find that with uh, Billy's co-founder, Dion. Um, that said, uh, uh, Billy, maybe you should answer this. Is I guess, like, what has LRT DeFi meant for term finance? Like, I'm not sure if you know exactly how much liquidity was deposited in relation to EE and all of the auctions that have run with EE, but... More generally speaking, like what has it meant for Chun Fung Nins? It's been wonderful. I mean, partnering with folks like Mike and Equal Pie has unlocked a tremendous amount of demand. We've been clearing you know, several million dollars of, of heat loans against Eaton. And I think that's allowed, you know, clients of likes to basically put that back into the eigen pool to, to essentially lever up and catch some of those eigen points. It's an incredible meta right now. Mike, what, what do you have to say about the strategy to grow BD? I mean, I can say from a user perspective, you know, I, I minted EG, I think in what early December for the first time then. And at that point, I think you had like three or four integrations like Maverick and Curve. And, yeah. Just the DEXs. Yeah. Yeah. Gra- Graviton, I remember being an early one. Right. Now, if you check out the DeFi tab on, uh, on EtherFi, I mean, it's just, it's like hard to keep up. In fact, terrible UI because it's just a giant list of no, party. No, no. <laughs> well, yeah. Yeah. We're I, working on it. I, I never, I never thought that EtherFi would, you know, turn into this like mega points dashboard with all the yeah. DeFi tracking that you have to do that. But anyways, that said, like, what, yeah, what has LRT finance, like, the true utility of EE meant for the growth of EtherFi? Yeah, look, I, I mean, I think it's important to uh, acknowledge and just uh, base the reality. Like, this is a speculative uh, boom. That That's really, people are speculating on the value of these points. That's, people are very excited about restaking and the the potential, but the the sort of immediate catalyst is, you know, people farming these, uh, these points. Um and so what we've focused on is just making that easy, making that uh, 
um, as accessible to people as possible uh, as far as like integrating with, I think we've got like 40 integrations now. Um, but our goal is to, uh, ubiquity. I mean, our goal is that, you know, in the same way that, uh, you know, Lido, which pioneered the, you know, the, the liquid staking space, they, you know, they've got a great product. They have a token. It's basically everywhere. It's in every DEX, every centralized exchange, every, you know, most DeFi protocols. That That is table stakes. Like, I think if you want to be a good staking protocol, and this, uh, maybe I'll, I'll talk a little bit about where I think staking is going, but if you want to be a good staking protocol, that is table stakes. You have to be in every DeFi protocol, in every DEX, every centralized exchange. You, you cannot have any trade-offs of holding ETH versus holding EE in our case. You really, it needs to be, I'm not, I'm not taking any, uh, you know, any, um, I'm missing, I'm not missing out on anything by holding EE. Like first and foremost, we have to be, Etherify has to be a really great way to get long exposure to, to ETH. Uh, and then the, the other stuff is a bonus. Uh, you know, that's, um, uh, th- th- I think that's important to understand that, uh, for us. And that's how we're thinking about this, uh, this market, especially after this hype and mania ends, because it will, of course, end. I mean, it's uh, mathematically, it, it's going to consume all the money in the world. If it's, so like, that's not going to happen. So uh, at some point, it's uh, it's going to turn over. Uh, and so, yeah, so the last thing I'll say is also, um, um, I don't think there's going to be, you know, staking and restaking in the future. I, I think uh, restaking is V2 of staking. Um if you just do the math of what happens as a lot of ETH gets staked, let's say, imagine a world where 70, 80, 90% of ETH is staked, which is probably where it's going to go. Um, and in a world where, you know, data availability layers have substantially reduced the price of uh, block space, which is basically what they, what they do. Um, and MEV is less of a thing because people have learned to, you know, to, to mitigate it. Um, the, the asymptotic yield that you get on staking given current protocol parameters is about like one and a half percent. That's that's like the base rate. And so eventually that's where we're going to be. Is staking yield is going to drop to like one to two percent. And then most of the yields, most of the returns are going to come from restaking. And so there's not going to be like these two categories. There's going to be one category of staking where restaking is just a natural part of uh, like built into to everything. And so that's how we view Etherfy is really like we are a next generation staking protocol um, rather than, you know, um, a points farm or whatever. Like uh, it, it, first and foremost, we have to be a good staking protocol, which means also being super Ethereum aligned. One thing, uh, Billy, I'm wondering how you guys are thinking at term about like down the road uh, as you know, Eigenlayer evolves and Etherfy evolves. When when we get to Eigenlayer being fully live and we have these AVSs that are live, um, EE, you know, under the hood, there's a lot going on there. And right. and to be clear, like I would I would dumb it down to this: like you have all these AVSs in the future that EE could be exposed to, and there's a lot of risk management there, which I want Mike to be able to touch upon here. Um, so with that. Right. Like there is more risk to be inherited. So I'm just curious, like it's still really early right now. ETH represents, you know, eigenlayer points. It represents some ether five points. It represents ETH staking yield. Um, so I, I feel like we're, we're in a really like great time to just keep it simple and, and be able to use that as collateral. But anyways, how does term think about the future state of something like ETH? No, exactly. I think it's one of the, actually major benefits to a protocol like term for people that would like to get exposure to all the benefits of the restaking yields, but you know, want to transform that from a risk management perspective. Because all the AVSs, they'll be doing various activities that will be generating the underlying yield, but it's kind of like, you know, corporate debt related to government debt. You know, there's some embedded additional risk into that. And so with over collateralized lending like term, you know, once we get past this this points meta, you know, Pendle is a really great product for that. I mean, there's really no denying it's awesome. You know, but we're 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 where term can play a really interesting role in this ecosystem long term is transforming that risk to unlock capital in interesting ways, but doing it from or you know with risk conscious. So you know, right now on term to borrow against uh, Raptor Yee. You know, it's 125% over collateralization. So if there were, you know, 
underlying risks where, you know, ABS are getting slashed or there's some sort of negative externalities embedded within that ecosystem, you know, lenders are getting extra protection for providing that capital that, you know, you wouldn't necessarily get with a product like Pendles. Pendles is really just an interest rate swap transforming, you know, the embedded yield that people are speculating on for the points that are going to be coming about, you know, plus any of the, the staking yields as well, and, and then transferring some of that risk into the fixed yield for the PT side. And like, yeah, it, right now it's kind of a no-brainer. There's really no underlying embedded risk besides just underlying staking. But as we kind of, as eigenlayer progresses and advances, I think what Term is building actually provides a little bit more of a product market fit for transforming that risk and unlocking that capital where some of the other protocols, it just is not quite as risk conscious. I think the, a feature you guys need to have is auto rolling. I'm sure other people have. Uh, yeah. So, so we have like it. I, so for I borrowers, for borrowers, we have auto rolling. Yeah. So for we, lenders, we had to pick, we had to pick one or the other. Oh, really? The way that it's set up because a loan matures on a certain date and then the borrower has 24 hours to repay that. And so the lender won't actually have the proceeds of the loan until you know the borrower repays or the borrower is liquidated because they didn't come back to repay the loan. So you know we uh, we had to make a decision: borrowers or lenders. And so for borrowers, you know they're kind of like the you know the core user of term. You know that we're the, that's the the and and for them to actually come back and repay the come up with the capital to repay the loan early, mm-hmm. it's a much more cumbersome activity. Mm-hmm. For them because they would have to then unwind a position come back you know it's just it's um it's a little bit more difficult for the borrowers for lenders yes i think we're we're term is going to look to solve some of those pain points for lenders because either to, to reshow up at an auction you either have to have just like capital sitting on the sidelines to make new loans is really work on vault strategies and vault providers so mm. make it a little bit more passive for you know, someone like you, Mike, who wants to lend. Yeah, I just want to be like, I've placed the bid, placed the same bid on the next auction. Yeah. I don't want to, I don't want the money back. Just place the same bid. And so, so kind of like, you know, you have the T bill market. You can go on Treasury Direct as an individual and you can participate mm-hmm. in Treasury Direct to buy T bills as an individual. Most people don't do that, right? They, if they want those sort of T bill type yields, they dump it into, they dump their cash into a money fund mm-hmm. and then pay a manager, you know, a small fee to get that convenience feature of not having to be there and participate in treasury bond auctions, treasury bill auctions. And so that's actually one of the things that we're, you know, cooking up now with some, you know, providers like Enzyme where they have vaults and then have underlying managers to be there to perform those functions. And that's kind of like a more of a professional style product. And and honestly, term is not like our target user is not retail. It's definitely a professional institutional quality of user, someone that's you know, in the weeds on a day-to-day basis, participating in these markets, whereas most retail kind of wants that experience you're talking about. It's just like, set it, forget it. And, you know, um, the the optimal way of operating fixed rate loans is on a fixed term. If you have anything that's open-ended, it's just impossible to guarantee a fixed rate. At some point, it becomes variable. So fixed term is a, is a necessity to have scalable, true fixed rates. And so, you know, there there has to be some trade-offs. In the traditional finance world, you have the infrastructure set up with professional large scale money managers. And so that's, you know, who Term is partnering with to give that kind of set it and forget it like feel in a crypto native style way. I'd be surprised if someone isn't already thinking to build that vault because to, to Mike's point, yeah, I, I'm used to like going in and looking at the auctions like, you know, every week or every four weeks. Um, as a borrower, it's easy because I've elected to do the rollover, right. so that's been all automated. But yeah, I, I think this is a great reminder of like what you guys have been building is really lower in the stack, and and you know these are, I think in the future like it's going to be like the in the larger crypto institutional type lenders and borrowers that you know really dig in there. But yeah, that that's a cool idea, Mike. I I love that. Um, going back to some of the risks uh, related to uh, managing, you know, exposure to all these ABSs in the future, like you've always been the best at like really like predicting or telling me what that future looks like. 
I, I guess like anything else you can share for like those of us who hold EE and will continue to use it in places like term um, as collateral or as an LP on, on like a DEX, um, like what will we be exposed to or be aware of? Like, can I, can I envision like a dashboard that's like, these are all the AVSs. This is the average yield being earned. This is a risk score for some of these. I, I don't know if there's anything you've already been building out given how early. We um, yeah, for transparency, that's something that we're, we're going to have probably. Um, yeah, and my thing has been evolving over the last like, I mean, in a couple of weeks. Is I so much like, is changing so quickly. Um, and here's some random thoughts and I'll try to hold them together. Like, there is going to be 100% a mass slashing event Absolutely. because of ABS. Yep. There is going to be a billion dollars of ETH, whatever, pick a number, that gets slashed. Right. Um, and in in the role that we play, which is trying to be a ubiquitous next generation staking protocol, tail risk protection and loss prevention is like the only thing that matters. It, it's much, much more so than like trying to optimize you depends it depends what game you're playing if you're playing the the dgen we're going to give you wild 30 percent yields and you're going to get slashed all the time there's a place for that we're not going to be that we are going to be the, the boring lrt um and in the context because that's what lasts because we don't want to blow up um uh because we want to do this for a long time i, I like i i Look at this as like a 10, 20 year journey. It's not something I, I, I don't really care what happens in a year. I, I care what happens over the long term. Um, and so in the context of that, the only thing that matters is, um, uh, it is, is terrorist protection. So, um, when I think about the role that we play, I, uh, we are going to play a much more, uh, uh, the role of a curator that A, selects only the best AVSs where the slashing risk of those AVSs and the just general, you know, risk, because um, you're, you're really putting your ETH into the smart contracts of those AVSs. Like, it's now routed through that. Even more, in fact, it's even more risky because now you're taking, there's an off-chain component to it. Um, so our, our assessment of AVSs is going to be like, look, anything that's more risky than Ethereum consensus risk, which is, as, as close to zero as you can get um, and as insurable as a result, we're just not going to do it. There's going to be a thousand EVSs. We might only work with 10 of them um, uh, because our only goal is not to optimize yield. Our goal is to make sure that nobody loses their their money because if you are in a, you know, a protocol like, like ours, an LST, if you lose, if you take a one or 2% loss, you're gone. You're just dead. Like, especially if you, if you, if you're trying to play the role of, look, we're institutional grade, we're trusted, we're, we're mature. If one day you're like, your graph suddenly takes a dip, like you're just dead. Um, and so the only thing that matters is terrorist protection. And in that context, I don't see how we could do anything, whether we, when I say we, I mean, whether it's like, you know, gauntlet or whoever, uh, plays that, uh, that role or, or committee, but like our focus is going to be 100% on ensuring that there are no, uh, losses and when that mass slashing event occurs, which inevitably it will, uh, we're we're the hell away from that. Um, so that's kind of how I've been. Uh, uh, like I, I previously would have been much more open to a um, a govern like we're obviously gonna have a governance model, but like a governance style model where people vote and bid and it's a bribe market like Convex or or, or something. Um, I I think that's actually a bad idea in the role that we're looking to play. Um, some version of that might actually make sense, but like the, the sort of linear kind of, okay, we're just going to do exactly that as a bad idea. Yeah, I agree. I, I think that, uh, one, like he, like he pointed out, a, a large slashing event is inevitable. Probably something like, I appreciate the fact you've been really candid about that. Something like we all should be a little more candid about. I, I think if, if you're anticipating that, you know, folks, won't be as shocked when it happens. And, and again, this is part of the reason that like, we're so excited for what you're building with EtherFi because it has to be built the right way. People are going to get, the market's going to get really done. That's something like, we're in a bull run. Going to get really dumb. It's, it's, it's already, <laughs> yeah, we might already be there. It's, it's yeah. going to get much dumber. going to get dumber, yes. And yeah, probably, yeah. It's, it's really important that, I mean, I want to remind folks that like that baseline of just the, 
the staking yield is fantastic. And to your point, if you understand that there will not be LSTs and LRTs, it'll just be LRTs are really like LSTs 2.0, then like that's it. You can get that liquid uh, staking passive yield as a baseline. And for me, it's like anything else on top of that, it's just icing on the cake. Um, I want to wrap up with just a, a more clickbaity question for the two of you. Uh, both of you are, are, you know, I would call you crypto OGs. You've been through three, four, five, like bear cycles, bear cycles, whatever. And uh, I'm curious, you know, as builders, um, despite the fact that I know your head's down in the weeds, focused on, you know, building, like you pointed out, Mike, for 10 to 20 years out, we still at the same time have to pay attention to the market because that, that treasury is so important. Actually, Mike, congrats on you just raised $27 million. So <laughs> your treasury should be uh, plenty, plenty healthy. Um, that said, guys, how far are we into this bull run? Like, are we 25, 50%? Or how do you think about that as a builder? Um, where again, like it's important to be conscious of that given the funds you raise and given like all the advantage of attracting new users during a bull run and then preparing for all the cool things you can build when it's a little bit quieter in a bear market. So anyways, how far along? Um, are we? I mean, I think it's, it's important to understand that, uh, well, first of all, the Fed de facto has pivoted. So the money printers back on. That's why there's a party, like everything's going up. The crypto beta uh uh like correlation of bitcoin ether whatever with nasdaq it, it's literally like 0.95 it, it is it, it's exactly like you're 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 getting levered beta is what you're getting right. with crypto that's a bad thing hopefully at some point it decouples based on like real economic activity not just you know gambling um but that's that's why we're in a bull market it's not like oh technology has gotten so much better fundamentals are like, no, it's the, the money printers back on. That's what's happening. Um, so the question then becomes, okay, well, how long is the money printer going to stay on? When's the next uh, cycle? Um, I, I mean, it's not hard to imagine the last thing of the year, like maybe maybe more. It, it's hard to hard to really predict how high the bubble goes, but uh, it's, you know, we might have another year to run. Yeah. But yeah. that's a total guess. So. And, and friends and family aren't really asking about crypto yet at all. Yeah. I think yeah. this this week was probably the first time Someone's like, oh, I saw a news on Yahoo Finance that, you know, Bitcoin is up like 10% today. I'm like, well, that was last night. It was open, but they're just looking at like the ETF news. So I think it's starting to trickle in. To That's actually interesting. Yeah. Now that there's ETFs, uh, people are like looking at their tickers yeah. much more so than they would have before. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I mean, for, for term, like we're not trying to build like a bull market or bear market. thought. We're just trying to build great lending infrastructure within the ecosystem. And I think yeah. for us, we can go bull market, bear market, and have a really great protocol that anyone can tap into to get liquid. Um, it feels like now that like the mainstream trap buy world is coming, like not even just coming, but here and more and more present. And you know, I think that's just going to set things up for higher highs and maybe higher lows as we go forward. But it's just an exciting time. It's really just an exciting time. Yeah, I love it. I I, uh, I think uh, for anyone who's newer to these cycles, enjoy it because it goes very quickly. And I, I I am you know most excited this year for Eigenlayer to go live for the evolution of uh, EtherFi, how that impacts all of the LRT Fi like term, um, and then there's also the ETF which seems fairly likely imminent like this spring, but you know who knows. Again, it's it's all a sign of like, I think the the world uh, being able to get exposure to the space and also see this uh, more credible. You know, at the end of the day, like I feel like I'm we're always in the weeds as nerds, like you know, building, investing, using these protocols. But I, I do think it's important to remind ourselves, like there's so many folks outside of our space who would be excited to use this, who urgently like need. Uh, DeFi and EtherFi and term finance, but something like an e ETF really does inject a certain amount of credibility. So, like that's something else this year that I, I'm I'm personally very excited for, and opens up opportunities just within the the DeFi space too. Because I mean, when the ETF was coming out, we saw a good amount of demand for people that had traditional lending desks that were looking to get access to Bitcoin in order to facilitate ETF trading across the space. 
And so it's it's symbiotic. It doesn't have to be Trad5 versus D5 versus C5. It's just one major ecosystem tapping into you know different user bases and, and different risk profiles. <laughs> uh, in the end, I, and I always beat this drum, like there has to be real economic activity. Like the, the economy works because someone takes a bunch of sheet metal and turns it into a car. Right. Someone takes some rocks out of the ground, turns them into an iPhone. Like you have to take something of lesser value and turn it into something of higher value by applying insight. That that is what actually like makes sense and like that that's what actually matters in the long run. The gambling stuff is fun, but like does not actually create economic value. So we have to have a world uh, in, in the crypto universe where there's actual economic value being created. And there's there are aspects of that that are already there. Stable coins, just uh, mobility of capital that they facilitate real economic uh, value, like products like Term uh, and others that allow people to you know to to use their capital in a more efficient way that produce some economic value. But like in the end, you got to bring real world assets in, onto the blockchain. People have to build products like the the, the gambling stuff. Uh, and I get more nervous and annoyed during these bull markets than during bear markets because it's just like people lose their minds and uh, I think that you can get rich by like clicking some buttons instead of actually doing real you know work and create products. You know how I know when we're in a bull run is there's there's all of this uh, net new value. Let's call it like a services economy that um, this whole new digital services economy. <laughs> that EtherFi is powering. And I get excited just, again, when more folks are learning about things that I was like digging into for months or for a year, feeling like, I, I, like, I want to be clear, this bear market, I really felt uh, the same sort of, uh, what do I want to call it, uh, lo- loneliness that you feel during the bear market where you're like, am I just a weirdo? Like I'm digging into all this stuff and I think it's really cool. And I think it's really promising. And this is stuff too, to be clear. It's not like everything that I would have like an investment in uh, myself. So this, I get excited and and that's what the bull run for me is it's that kind of validation of like seeing other people trickle in and say, hey, like that is really cool. Like, wow, that's like really powerful. So like with EE was the most like natural layup um, at the end of 2023 because I had been looking at Eigenlayer and honestly, I was lamenting the caps race. I was like, I'm never going to get into this. I'm so sick and tired of having to like race there when the caps race happens. Like, I don't want to do this. Also, I want to use my LSTs. This was, you know, back when I was holding LSTs. Now I just hold LRTs, but I was holding these legacy LSTs and I was really frustrated. I'm like, the point of this thing is for me to be able to use it in DeFi. You're telling me now I got to lock it up. I have no idea like when this thing's going to be live. It just felt really silly. Yeah, to take, taking a step back. But you, you kind of gave all that utility back to us. So anyways, for folks that want to uh, get in touch or learn more about EtherFi in turn, Mike, where, where should they go to learn about EtherFi? Go to ether.fi, uh, min some ETH, and then use it in DeFi. That's uh, as simple as that. I love we that. abstract all the complexity. And, and once they mint that, then they should go to what? Go to, yeah, go to app.term.finance. You know, participate in our weekly auctions. And yeah, lock in a fixed rate against your wrapped ED. Awesome. Guys, congrats on all the progress. Great to see you both. Thanks for, thanks for joining us. Thanks, yeah, guys. thanks for having me. And um, I'm joined here by Andy from the Rollup company. So I'm going to let Andy tell the story of the Rollup. But like, you're a DeFi OG. We've, we've been... You've been in the space since at least like what, 2019, 2020. And I just want to pick your brain about like, you've been harping on modularity. And I feel like you were beating the drum on this before and the market caught up with it. So just congrats on that. Like, it's kind of a cool thing, right? To like be really excited about something and then have everybody else dogpiling into that. Um, anyways, before we talk about that, what is the roll up company? What, what do you do, Andy? Who are you? Why are you here? Yeah, thanks. It's a, uh... This is a great, great spot, by the way. So thank you for having me. Um, I mean, like, like this is only in crypto, right? Um, and yeah, I mean, I mean, I, I've been a big fan of your content as well since since you started. And um, a bit about the roll up is we're an education company. That's our our number one goal is to learn and to act as a hub for others to learn with us. Um, I met my co-founder Rob in university at a blockchain club in 2017. We were quite young freshmen. Um, and we kind of pioneered that. And that's where this idea of like learning from people in the space came from. And then kind of fast forward to 2020 DeFi summer erupted. 
Um, and we were very intrigued by yeah, the idea of being able to do things on chain. Like in 2017, it was like you're just buying coins on exchanges. But now it's like DeFi is a thing. And so we just decided to go all in, not only with time, effort, capital, and just kind of floor it and see what happens with this kind of Ethereum experiment. And so by doing that, we realized that there's a lot of value in education. So, so we've started our podcast. I'm sure that there'll be a bunch of links in the description and things. And just very happy to be educating people about the space. Then Vitalik came and said, you know what, guys, we need to scale Ethereum, the roll-up centric roadmap. Mid-bear market, our first project, DeFi Slate, was kind of like growing out of itself. That was like our, our, our infancy, our entrance. We were like, let's, let's try to take this to the next level, rebrand, do it bigger and better kind of concept. And so that's how the roll-up was born. Um, and now we do a lot of focus on uh, modular blockchains, roll-ups, and just scaling the infrastructure um, for applications to thrive on chain. Um, and so our thesis is if we can educate people, then we can bring on more people, we can get more developers in the space, more users, and just broadly have that impact on the space while all the gigabrain devs do their work. So one of the cool things about Ethereum Denver is, you know, it's expanded beyond this like core event that's in the sport castle here. So uh, there's all these satellite events and, and some of those, they, you know, they go beyond like the obvious ETH and ETH L2 events, uh, which again, I think is just really cool. It's kind of a sign of the growth and maturity of the industry. Um, I was at Modular Day with you, which I think was run by Movement Labs and uh, Celestia. So for folks that are, are less familiar with this like monolithic versus modular term, uh, there was actually a debate. I think that you were... It was real good. Yeah, you, you were covering this and maybe you can share some of the highlights of that or just, I, I'd love to kind of dumb down like what are some of the, uh, the core ideas to like monolithic versus modular does it does it feel like the modular side of the debate won yesterday i'm i'm very curious the debate was way too diplomatic and i'll kind of tell why after we get into just like the core principle here so the idea is that up until recently blockchain designs have tried to embed multiple processes into one blockchain so you've got this this layered stack of 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 settlement execution and data availability and consensus are like th th those are the three big terms it gets a, lo a lot more tricky but that's like the core concept and this idea behind modular is to unbundle these these specific processes of the blockchain function which operates for transactions for like to let a blockchain function in the best capacity it's to unbundle these parts and rather than trying to do all these parts in one one blockchain you actually input specialized code bases at each layer of the stack to then make what is called a modular blockchain. So it's almost like a blockchain made of separate blockchains. And effectively what this does, and the example that I like to use, is if you had a, a soccer team or, or, or football for, for those not in the US, and you had a team of strikers, you guys would kill it. You guys would score a bunch of goals, but you would probably wouldn't win too many games. You certainly wouldn't win a championship where is if you played a team of strikers, midfielders, goalies, and a good coach or a defenseman, right? There's You get a better end product. And so that's kind of like the bullish thesis behind modularity. Now, kind of the debate was a different story. It was very diplomatic. You've got Nick White of Celestia putting his monolithic hat on and saying, yeah, guys, monolithic is going to win in the short term, right? There's there's, there's struggles and challenges to scale modular blockchains because of interoperability and because of these kind of specialized code bases. There's different attack vectors. There's different risks. And there's these. And then you have the Solana guy saying, well, I'm pretty sure all these monolithic blockchains are going to end up scaling in a modular fashion. So we're sitting there and we're like, guys, like, can, can we please have some spice? Um, but generally, I think a lot of these blockchain structures, as we're seeing, will come and launch their own app chain to, to control their own execution environment. They will do these on things like the OP stack um, using rollup as a service providers. They will use DA, which is data availability, like Celestia, like Avail, like Near. They won't use the EVM. So I think the thesis here lies is we are at the beginning of a new era where block space is going to become extremely abundant. We're going to see an explosion of tons of new blockchains with different design choices that, ha that we haven't seen yet. 
And that's the beauty of modularity is it's this optionality at the forefront and trying to create the best blockchains without um, giving up the core principles of why we're here. It's, it's about solving the, the blockchain trilemma without sacrificing on, on centralization and without really giving in to this idea of um, scaling in a centralized manner and doing things uh, right and secure. And also, I'll end it off by saying it's just kind of one big experiment. And that's why I love it. It's like this team is doing with this execution environment, this data availability later. This team's doing this app chain. And so there's all these different experiments happening in parallel, which is so exciting to see. And it feels like DeFi summer, where it was new application, new yield farm, new project. But now it's new blockchain trying to do this specific use case. And they're building it in a modular fashion. And so there's a lot of challenges ahead with interoperability, but that's what really excites me. And I think at a core level, what it means um, to be like a modular blockchain. I can't remember if it was you or someone else, but I heard this like clever analogy that, uh, you know, what we saw with the onset of ERC-20 tokens, like, you know, just the idea anyone could launch a token. That is what we're seeing now with blockchains like that that's what's possible now and i I do want to give credit to like you know i think uh celestia before their launch it it still felt like a pie in the sky type of idea but now that they are live and and we have eigen da coming and 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 others there's other da providers uh it's it's more real you know it's like cool to see you know it's cool to see more and more of these like new networks actually launching um i'm curious though like like as someone who's clearly spent, you know, more of my time and effort on like ETH and ETH L2s over the years, despite the fact that I'm clearly like very involved in like other chains and networks, modular for me, this modular monolithic debate, like modular was, uh, you know, when you said it, it, it was applied to Ethereum and, and it was, uh, you know, a part of the debate that, you know, Ethereum really will continue to scale at a rate that other networks will probably struggle to struggle to keep up with that said i do admit like it feels like that modular narrative has clearly expanded and i'm wondering like how do you think about that andy like how how do you how do you explain the fact that you know now there are folks saying well yeah like i i could you know we could start a, a whole new network and piece this together because of modularity and that's actually bearish for ethereum anyways as someone who focuses on this like what what are your thoughts yeah and the best part is i've asked this question to some of the, these modular builders and we're getting to a similar point in responses so i'll kind of um explain what they said and also add my thoughts is that ethereum is generally going to be extremely dominant as a settlement layer for the security of rollups on top of ethereum there will be no passing of the baton as far as the best settlement layer for modular rollups. Rollups can be modular blockchains that settle to Ethereum, right? So, so we have Ethereum as a settlement layer, and then the two other layers, execution and data availability. It's my thesis that we'll see a lot of these blockchains launch with non-Ethereum DA, so Celestia, Avail, etc., and non-EVM, Movement, Cartesi, uh, tons of other projects, right? And so this is scary for Ethereum in a sense, but it's I think it's all part of Ethereum's kind of general direction to focus on on uh, a data availability roadmap with this upcoming upgrade. Teams will still use Ethereum for data availability. It's the most secure. It's, it's the best. But even if they don't, they will still settle to Ethereum, and many will. And so for me, modular blockchains is exactly what Ethereum needed to scale as an asset for like the big money in the world. Because once we have thousands of chains that actually are useful and are really well done and well orchestrated and they settle their value to ethereum you can go to anybody and explain that ethereum is valuable because all of these chains which all have their own demographics network effects use cases users etc they all rely on ethereum for economic security that's why i'm so excited about id layer as well extending the economic security of ethereum is like super super important because I don't think it makes much se- much sense to launch your own L1. Why not just launch a rollup, use the modular parts of the stack, use a different VM, use a different DA, um, settle to Ethereum, get the economic security of, of, of Ethereum, and not have to figure out how to bootstrap your own uh, community and network effects. And so combination of Ethereum and Eigenlayer is mega bullish. 
And I think modular just puts an entire new realm of like possibilities for how Ethereum operates as a settlement layer. Um, and I think that'll be reflected in ETH, the asset. Uh, but for a second there, when I was diving deep into modular, I agree with you. Um, and I was asking this question to builders. Like I was like, guys, like what's the point of Ethereum here? And then I'm now I'm realizing, well, Ethereum, it, it's, it's the end all be all state of all these things to kind of settle to and, and all these blockchains to be a part of. Um, and yeah, not so bullish on the EDM though. Andy, we're going to do a follow-up to this. I know like we're, we're going to hopefully in the next few weeks, like we, we probably could talk for two hours about this. So I, I'm going to cut the rest of this off before we go too long. Um, but for folks that want to learn more about uh, you and the Roll Up company, what would you recommend? And just, dude, great to meet you finally. Like I, I really appreciate the content you guys are putting out. I mean, everything you said about educating folks on modularity and Ethereum and crypto in general. I mean, you, you know, like clearly I, re I resonate with all of that like that. So anyways, just like really nice to meet in person. But how can we get involved, benefit, learn from the Roll Up company? Yeah, and I just want to say, man, you've been a big, big, big inspiration. Um, when, when Rob and I started in, to really pump content early 2020, you know, there was, a, it was, there was a lot of nerves. There was a lot of, is this DeFi thing real? And, you know, you and others kind of led the way there. Uh, as far as us, we are the roll up. Um, you can find me on, on Twitter as a Andy with, with the penguin, the roll up CO on Twitter, as well as our, our website is the roll up dot CO. Uh, we're on YouTube, um, Spotify with, with our podcast DeFi by design under the roll up. And, um, just last plug, when this goes out, it'll probably be sometime March. Hopefully, if, if DeFi Dad can get his head around all these edits, um, we're throwing a massive content series called Modular March, kind of the epitome of, of a lot of this work, bringing in some of the best builders to the space, giving technical presentations, uh, giving them a platform for to do panels, spaces, um, written content, and help them to really push their big um, upcoming announcements and activations. We have a lot of modular blockchain projects launching tokens very soon and launching like big test nets or big, big uh, official launches on, on mainnet. So we're going to kind of push that forward throughout March and just wanted to plug that. And otherwise, thanks. Thanks, man. We're not even going to give the elevator pitch here on Pendle because Pendle Finance is, is now, I think, like a top 15, top 10 DeFi application. It's something I check daily because... It started out as this interest rate swap platform, which was a very sophisticated DeFi use case. And they have evolved into a platform that caters to a very DeFi native use case, which is, I feel like now it's like this leveraged farming of points with LRT Fi, like EETH and, and Swell and, and uh, uh, Kelp and some, and I'm, I'm forgetting like there's, there's so many of these LRTs you've launched. So that said, Anton, I'm curious if you can just reflect on the last few months of growth. Like I remember when the EE pool launched and now we've got this tokenized principle where we have a principal token and a yield token and the yield token, the key to this in Pendle was that your team brilliantly decided, I I'm guessing along with EtherFi that this yield token that folks trade would accrue all of the points. And as a result of that, I think it's allowed us, you know, to permissionlessly speculate on the value of these points and the, you know, what those points will translate to at a later date in terms of a, an airdrop. What have you learned from all of this madness? Like what, what's next? You, I, I think you launched some more LRT pools in, in the last day. I probably missed uh, a few of these. Yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, just earlier today, we reached a 2 billion TVL. So that's uh, pretty exciting. Congrats on that. Yeah, thank you so much. And yeah, I think that, you know, the whole points meta in this market right now, uh, the conversation around it started like very early on, like with Ether5. And we're kind of like trying to figure out how we can be more involved in that eigenlayer ecosystem. And, you know, with eigenlayer, people would want to deposit into your their depositing contract because they would want to, you know, get those points. But we were thinking, how do we allow that to happen? But, you know, you don't have to ex exactly expose yourself by depositing there, but also gain a leverage of, you know, being able to accumulate those points, right? So we started this off with EtherFi 
because they're kind of like, you know, one of the first and forefronts in uh, LRTs. And, you know, we just had this idea, like, why don't we put all those points to the yield token? Because the yield token basically gives you the right to all the underlying yield. And you can basically have this dynamic market where if you don't actually like those points, you can forgo those and get a fixed rate as instead for EE. But if you're more degen, you can actually just, you know, get exposure to YT, the yield token, buy cheaply, you know, like as compared to the underlying price itself and, you know, get a higher leverage in accumulating all those points. So at this you know, point of time, we've already worked with several LRTs. So right now there's, um, of course, uh, Ether5, there's Renzo, there's Kelp. There's, um, you know, Bedrock with uni -E. And um, yeah, there's, there's a whole lot more to come. I mean, there's an explosion of LRTs in this ecosystem. But even beyond that, right, like because everything is kind of like about points right now. So we've also recently worked with Athena and they have that, you know, shards market as well. So shard is kind of like points. And we also have that, you know, people can basically speculate on the value of shards right now. And, um, you know, we also work with Swell with, you know, they also have like the R suite as well. And, you know, with their pearls. So essentially it's all the same kind of like mechanism around it. And yeah, you can get that points leverage or shards leverage or whatever uh, on Tendle. I, I think one of the fundamentals, and this, this is a credit to the, the content and the documentation that Pendle created during the bear market to like educate us as users. So when you have that PT and YT token, they're, they're always, if you add them together, they're always equal to one, right? Yep, yep, exactly. So they're inversely related. And so what's happened is by you creating, by, by you catering to us as DeFi users who, who wanted to be able to capture these points through the YT token, as the buying pressure increased on that, the, the, the price of the PT token actually dropped which has also then created a whole nother opportunity of these insane yields with uh, liquid restaked ETH. So in, in many For cases, sure. like those PT tokens are trading at a, uh, call it a 20 to 30% discount. So if I buy that and I hold it through maturity, the APY equates to me earning like, let's say 20, 30, 40%. Um, and, and again, like what's cool about all this is like, these are, those are like real yields, you know, because of the buying pressure on the YT token. Well, Anton, like, what, what's the lesson there? Is it like, I, I felt like you guys started out trying to translate a TradFi use case. Like, you can trade yield. You can trade, again, interest rates, uh, wh whatever. There, That was some of what was communicated. And now I, I feel like you just clearly simplified that, listened to users, and and ended up with, like, like hey, do, do you want to buy points? Like, that. that's basically, yeah. like, the, yeah. the messaging nowadays. Yeah, for sure. So I think it goes back to the main motivation of why we started Pendle. So back to DeFi summer with all those crazy APYs of like, you know, 10,000, 20,000 APY, like, you know, with Olympus DAO, et cetera. We just wanted to, you know, find a product out there where you can actually hedge your risk against those high APYs. And, you know, coming to what we have today with all the points, et cetera, you basically now have a dynamic market where, you know, people who are very bullish on points can do so. But for those who aren't and want to hedge their risk against it, like, for example, with Athena and their USDE, right? Now, the fixed rate on that, you can actually get a 90% fixed rate on USDE. And, you know, that's a great opportunity for those who, you know, would want to forgo for their shards. And, um, yeah, and I think that, you know, early on, it was a very complex product for sure. But we definitely believed in what we were doing. You know, we dogfooded a lot, uh, the, the actual product that we're, we're using because we, we are, you know, very... Uh, staunch DeFi users. We're very crypto native, DeFi native. And so I think that with our commitment to what we were building, we just, you know, doubled down in all the education, all the threads. If you've been following our Pendle intern, uh, there's very cool threads around that. So we just basically distilled the complexity of like how YT and PT works into, you know, actionable steps that anyone can partake in. And, you know, they'll be able to recognize the, or like uh, realize these APYs. And the great part is that with this high APYs, these, these aren't deals that's, that are minted out of thin air. This is actually a market around it where, you know, there's a counterparty against your trade. So that's why you're actually getting these yields. Anton, I have so many other questions, but I, I know we're, we're only, you know, we only have like 10 minutes here. So um, for folks that want to learn more about Pendle, uh, especially the documentation I referenced, like there's some really cool guides in there. Like I used a lot of this to edit a podcast we did with uh, one of the co-founders, yep. TN. Like that, that, that was a struggle because back then, this was prior to 
the uh, all of the points farming going live. So even then, I was I was personally trying to wrap my head around all these like really powerful use cases. But to your guys' credit, like you just dumb it down. You know, you put it into like really like normal human language that we can all understand. So for folks that want to uh, get started or learn more about Pendle Finance, um, where can they go? Sure. So you can definitely follow us at uh, X Twitter, um, Pendle underscore Fi. Um, you know, we, we have a Discord as well. You can always find that at our website for that link. So Pendle.finance. And for the educational part, so if you go to our app where it's uh, app.pendle.finance, there is a educational drop down on the upper left. And you can find there our Pendle Academy, our technical docs, and everything to, you know, talk about that. That's basically talking about the entire yield trading use case, all dumbed down in a very, you know, like de- digestible, like set of content. And uh, yeah, like, you know, we always welcome feedback. So if there's anything that you'd like us to simplify further, then we'd like to hear from you. But yeah, like, uh, hopefully you enjoy that content. And uh, yeah, like, uh, happy to connect with you guys in Discord. Dude, congrats on all the success. Thank it's, you. It's like crazy to watch you guys. I remember when you had like tens of millions. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like trying to write a tutorial on just how to like lend and earn a fixed rate. And now I'm like, wow, like billions of dollars. And, and you have builders just, I know, knocking down your door, like trying to figure out like, okay, how do we get our yield bearing token uh, in the Pendle? So anyways, excited for like for sure. what's next. Yeah, and uh, you know, like we always say um, internally, uh, job's not done. So we're very ambitious later this year, and uh, we have a lot of things to announce. So look forward to that. Uh, we're joined here today by Matt from the Maverick Protocol team, and uh, Maverick has been uh, one of the leading teams that's uh, building on zk Sync since zk Sync era had launched. So when you look at trading volume, you'll notice that Maverick is always there on that number one or number two slot. Um, There's a lot, though, that's gone into that in terms of the protocol design. And so we're going to talk just a bit more about uh, what Matt and his team are building. Maverick V2 is coming very soon. So we're excited to kind of tease some information out of of Matt here. Uh, But before we do that, Matt, do you want to just give a bit more information about like Maverick uh, protocol, like what differentiates it from other uh, AMM protocols? Sure, I'd love to. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Really happy to be here to talk about Maverick and ZK. Um, so Maverick, uh, like you said, is an AMM-based uh, liquidity infrastructure. Uh, it's built around the idea of concentrated liquidity. Uh, so the idea, right, that you concentrate LP's liquidity within a narrow range in in order to provide... Uh, more swaps, better prices, more trading fees for LPs. This thing we're familiar with is that Uniswap innovated. Uh, what Maverick set out to do was iterate on concentrated liquidity. So we looked at what wasn't working so well about concentrated liquidity. And the thing about concentrated liquidity is while your liquidity, is the range is concentrated around price, capital efficiency is very high. If the price in the pool then moves, is the price between two assets changes, uh, if it moves out of that range, capital efficiency goes from high to zero. And that can happen fairly quickly depending on the assets involved. So Maverick AMM represents a solution for this problem. Uh, we think of it as a dynamic distribution AMM, by which we mean uh, liquidity can be arranged into uh, custom, you know, concentrated ranges. And these ranges can actually be highly customized in Maverick AMM. So they're not just flat. You can create all kinds of shapes using it, uh, such as an exponential distribution or a ramp. You know, basically anything that you can imagine can be configured uh, through our UI. And then you can also, if you choose, uh, have the AMM then automatically move those distributions to follow the price in a pool. So uh, that keeps liquidity close to price, which means there's deeper liquidity for trades, which means that LPs are capturing more fees and traders are getting better prices. So... You just mentioned that you can shape liquidity. It's a very customizable AMM, if I'm just kind of like stripping away all the language. And so what has that meant for the growth of uh, uh, liquid restaking token DeFi, LRT DeFi? Maverick has leaned very heavily into this. I want to say that when EtherFi launched EETH, I believe Maverick was one of the first uh, DeFi integrations for EETH. And um, for those of us who have used LSTs in the past, it's it's always been fantastic to be able to like 
LP with, you know, two assets that are very correlated. So we have these very similar benefits now with LRTs, probably going to see a lot more of these pools of, uh, you know, something like EETH or other ETH uh, LRTs. Uh, so anyways, how's Maverick thinking about that? How are you able to optimize uh, for better liquidity, you know, better uh, better trading experience? It's a great question. And I could possibly go on at length about this. So please feel free to cut me off. Um, you know, we we all know that LSTs were really, if not the narrative of 2023, a dominant narrative. And now LRTs are kind of, you know, becoming placed to become the new one for 2024. Um, I would say it was a really happy accident that in trying to build this new kind of AMM, uh, the core developers for Maverick were actually able to build a sort of LST and LRT ready AMM without necessarily planning for it. So LSTs and LRTs weren't, on, weren't in the crosshairs when this was being developed. Um, but, you know, 2023 became the sort of the year of these native yield bearing tokens. Like you can basically expect, right, an LST to, to, is going to capture Ethereum yield. So let's say that any LST, if everything's kind of behaving normally, has got something like a 4% native sort of yield over, over time in a year, right? Now that means that in an AMM pool, in a concentrated liquidity pool, that price is always going to be creeping up. Again, in theory, absent external market forces. Um, so, you know, concentrate static concentrated liquidity AMMs are not built for this. They're not built for LSTs natively. Maverick AMM is. So, uh, you know, at its basis, ba most basic level, um, a Maverick uh, movement mode is highly useful for any pool that contains an LST or indeed an LRT or any native yielding token, uh, because as we see that price move up, the AMM can keep your liquidity following the price, and you don't have to be monitoring the pool, you don't have to be moving your liquidity, you don't have to be spending gas and all that kind of stuff. Now, um, we've seen though some interesting things happen, and it comes back to your point about the customizability of Maverick AMM. So that's the kind of the basic use case where you could think about the profile of a, an LST or an LRT in Maverick. Um, and you know, LRTs came along and, you know, if anything, they would have the same basic yield or maybe more. So it's like, great, we're good. We're ready for them as well. Um, but then this interesting complication comes along with LRTs, which is, we're probably all aware, one of the major features or selling points or things that people are interested about in LRTs right now is points. And these will be both eigenlayer points and also the points that someone like Etherfy or Swell are, uh, you know, giving to people who hold their, their LRTs. So if you choose to LP your LRT into what I was just talking about, something like an LRT ETH pool and use this movement mode, uh, there's an opportunity cost there because you're in ha like half your position or whatever, you're losing your points. So um, the LRTs like Etherfire come to us is like, you know, what we see right now LPs want is an LRT LRT pool. Um, and so yeah, they, now we're getting more into kind of correlated assets like you were talking about. Um, but the good news there was that um, I think perhaps the greatest success story for Maverick in, our, in the first year, 2023, has really been in stablecoin pairs because the, uh, the dynamic distribution AMM and particularly mode both, which, which will move liquidity the direction, um, enables you to LP in very, very narrow ranges for a stablecoin pair like USDC, USDT. Uh, and still kind of capture all the very small price fluctuations you see there. But so keep a large chunk of capital very active right wherever that fluctuation has gone. So correlated assets work great with mode both. So that's, you know, the first step for us is like, okay, great. Um, it was, uh, you know, uh, EETH and our suite want to have a, you know, have a, a pair. Um, why not use mode both? But actually, because, you know, they understand their own token and their own liquidity needs so well, uh, they they put their big brains together, and for their first, um, we haven't really talked about boosted positions, but for their boosted position, which is their incentivized chunk of a Maverick pool, um, they actually went with static liquidity, but in a customized shape, a slight ramp, because understanding sort of they looked at the market conditions for the two LRTs, and basically based on the fact that our suite was a bit behind EETH in terms of launch, they had some kind of internal predictions about, you know, how the price between them would behave. And so they optimized their liquidity using a kind of customized shape in mode static. So again, gets a kind of detail there. But the important message is, you know, the customizability of distributions in Maverick AMM enabled these two projects to put together their pair, initial pair, exactly how they kind of wanted it.
Matt, though, I'm, I'm curious also if we can talk about uh, j- just the the change in the market sentiment. You know, you've you all have been building Maverick, uh, you know, not during the greatest, you know, period of, for, for us as builders, investors. You know, it's been a, a, a crypto bear market. So now that, you know, there's clearly new users uh, coming into the ecosystem, you know, numbers go up, which attract more users and, and so on. And so anyways, what does that mean for you guys at Maverick? Like, how do you take it? advantage or leverage the fact that we have more attention on us as an ecosystem um, and convert those into longtime users of Maverick and DeFi? It's a great question. Um, I arrived here, I arrived in the space at the end of 21. So in some ways, I've only known the winter. Uh, so um, uh, I could definitely you know, sort of speak about building in that environment, um, perhaps better than I'm equipped to speak about um, where it might go. Um, I mean, I remember my first ETH Denver was two years ago in 2022. And, you know, everyone was saying, well, winter is when we build, right? Winter is the time for builders. And I think in some ways, uh, the winter may have benefited Maverick because um, people are better po- uh, poised to notice or take advantage of, um, you know, a an innovative product. Like I think Maverick AMM is, you know, it's not all froth right? We're not just following the big narrative. People are, you know, being very careful. And so evaluating things quite closely. Um, and so, you know, um, maybe that gave us a bit more of a chance to stick stick out. The other thing is, you know, Maverick AMM. So all of these things I've been discussing about customizability and movement modes and, and you know, it all comes down to efficiency. We talk about capital efficiency a lot, but one way of boiling down what capital efficiency is, is doing more with less. Uh, and, you know, so going live, building and going live in a period where people want to use less or have less to throw around is in some ways, I think, creating good market conditions for a product like Maverick to thrive. Um, I mean, if you you cited the, the stats on ZK Sync earlier, um, since the end of last summer, Maverick has basically been the number one DEX by volume on ZK Sync, um, regularly processing, I feel comfortable most of the time saying for the last you know, four or five months, we processed uh, facilitated 50% of decentralized trading volume on ZK Sync. But if you go to DeFi Llama and the DEX list and you look at um, look at the that trading volume next to the actual TVL of Maverick on ZK Sync, um, it's it's relatively low. So, you know, Maverick A- is the kind of proof of concept that you can do more with less using Maverick AMM because of these improvements to capital efficiency. Um, you know, I, I mentioned the success of Maverick AMM with stablecoin pairs. Um, of course, you know, in the bull, I think people have wanted to stick to stable coins more. Um, so, you know, we've had these successful stable coin pools. Again, having a product that's good uh, at giving you returns on stable coins has proved a benefit. And then um, I can't remember who I was hearing say this. I think it was actually, um, it may have been um, uh, Mike from Etherfy on your own podcast, right? Who was talking about how LST sort of captured the one kind of maybe safe or stable yield in 2023, right, which is the Ethereum yield. Um, again, people are looking to hedge themselves. They're looking, they don't want to get too risky. They don't want to go long on on volatile tokens. Um, so again, having a an AMM that was, uh, you know, already had achieved like product market fit with the dominant uh, token for when people are hedging their bets, um, I think helped. Um, I think, you know, LSTs definitely seem to be a sort of a safe harbor when people were feeling a bit less confident. What's interesting to me is to think about how we, whether or not LRTs represent more of that narrative or if the popul- the explosion of interest in things like Eigenlayer is actually as much a summer or bull sentiment as it is a, you know, um, as it is like that kind of like safety from the bear sentiment. Um, I think, you know, none of us really know exactly where Eigenlayer is going to go, right? We don't yet know if, if the uh, the... The actual technology is going to get a real, find a real use case, and become a major part of the of the whole DeFi infrastructure. Yet, right? We're all uh, we're all hoping, we're speculating. Um, you know, the the points are there right now to to tide us over until we know where the yields are going to come from. So, you know, is is restaking is Eigenlayer the first story of the bull? I don't know. Um, uh, again, you know, it's just I guess for us, it's a matter of being poised to capture these new narratives now as they arise. Um, like you said, you know, the sentiment is turning, people are getting more excited. Um, we're definitely, you know, looking, 
looking to be a part of these narratives as they arise, uh, whether whether it's LRTs. You may, we were talking beforehand a bit about Athena, um, uh, and you know similarly we're thinking about what what which L2s are really going to be seeing their kind of uh, operations and popularity expand in the bull rush and see where Maverick can go next to kind of like you know enjoy some of that too. So Maverick V2 is, uh, we don't know the exact ETA, but I- I've been speculating that it could be by the end of Q1 or at worst, let's say like early Q2. Uh, anything you can share with us while it's still not launched and uh, also anything you can share about VMAV. I know there's there's some like updates or like, you know, there's like an evolution to VMAV launched, uh, you know, a, a pretty with a pretty simple design because again maverick has uh has been live for what over a year now i want to say almost exactly yes we launched in march of 23 it's, so. it's wild it feels like you guys have been live forever so uh a- anyways th- like any protocol there's there's just a lot more evolution coming here so yeah anything you can tease us with in terms of what we might benefit or enjoy coming with maverick v2 um and anything else about vmav yeah, thank you. I probably should have included this in the in the outlook of the forecast for what what the bull might mean. Um, uh, so, as you you are perhaps familiar with, maybe other are people are less um, within this time frame. You know, we're we're really hoping uh, you know within the end of Q1, maybe in Q2, uh, to be able to push out what we we've been calling Maverick Phase Three. Um, Maverick Phase Three sort of incorporates uh, a couple of a couple of uh, items. Uh, one of them uh, is a bit more technical. It will be the launch of Maverick AMM V2. Um, largely for most people, they won't see any kind of change. It's going to be the same sort of engine running the the, the decks that people are familiar with. Um, but there's going to be a number of significant tweaks under the hood. Uh, the primary one, doing which is to aiming to bring our gas costs even lower. So Maverick's uh, gas efficiency right now is extremely high. It's it's definitely one of the the cheapest, if not the cheapest. Uh, AMM for gas, um, and the uh, the developments being made by the core developers in the community in that regard um, in our early testing seem to promise that we're only going to push that even lower, which is huge for us um, because I was gesturing earlier to uh, things like stable coins uh, being very important for Maverick AMM and Maverick AMM LPs. We capture a lot of that stable coin volume from aggregators. Gas costs are a major part of how ga- aggregators decide to you know which is the best trade for anybody. Um, there's also, you know, we're hoping it might bring a couple of other little features uh, that are just being ironed out right now that I can't quite talk talk about. Uh, but more significant, what I can't talk about more, is Phase 3 also incorporates the launch of the full uh, VE MAV system, the voting escrow system. So this is, you know, a, uh, a protocol emission system, you know, similar to the ones that people are familiar with, with products like Curve. Essentially, uh, using staked MAV, we have this VE MAV token, the voting escrow token that you receive for staking your MAV, to direct protocol emissions towards specific boosted positions on Maverick. Um, we are, we've talked a bit, you can see it, you uh, find it on our medium, we've talked a bit about some of the goals here. It's sort of similar to the AMM. We're looking to, we've seen that people have done great things in DeFi, whether it's concentrated liquidity or you know protocol emissions or voting escrow systems. Just how can we iterate on those to improve the experience further? And our major goal uh, with the Maverick VE system is just to provide a, a more sustainable uh, emission system. So not one where you're just pumping emissions out all the time, uh, regardless of their benefit to the Maverick ecosystem. Uh, and more importantly, one that uh, will enable new participants in the Maverick ecosystem to get involved. What I mean by that is uh, we don't want a VE system where the early adopters or the whales are coming at the beginning, grab all the VE MAV, and then just kind of run the emission system to their own benefit. Um, so we're exploring some uh, uh, solutions to that. Um, one of the major ones being that w- that's been proposed so far, um, you know, in our, in our discussions about this in public is uh, linking protocol emissions to incentives in. So I, I, that, you know, boosted positions will not receive emissions unless they've also received incentives um we have a lengthy post where um you know bob one of our, our bigger brains in the protocol uh, contributes to the protocol he was talking about the idea of you know you can approach uh incentives as a kind of oracle the incentives show you which boosted positions are important or useful they're the ones that should get in emissions 
Um, we've got a lot of feedback from people in the industry, uh, very positive about it. Um, uh, so, you know, we're excited that pe hopefully people are going to like it, feel like it makes a difference. I mean, what this means for LPs is it's another source of return on their uh, the liquidity they provide to Maverick. So if you join a Maverick boosted position right now, uh, you should benefit from uh, trading fees. Uh, you also hope to benefit from any external incentives that have been added to the boosted position. This will be another layer on top of that, which will be protocol incentives that would be sent to that boosted position. So it's up to you know three different uh, streams of revenue for LPs. We've also got a an emerging kind of meta ecosystem from some liquid lockers like Spiral DAO and Stake DAO, um, who are going to provide opportunities for VE Mav holders perhaps to participate in bribe markets. Um, but we wait to see what develops there. Yeah, I'm, I'm I'm glad you called out those other partners because th that for me, uh, like being an early user of Maverick, I remember just being pleasantly surprised to know that there were teams that were building protocols dedicated you know, to optimizing liquidity uh, in Maverick. So r really cool stuff. Uh, well, I want to remind everyone they can learn more about Maverick by going to mav.xyz. Uh, they should follow Mav Protocol on Twitter. And then, uh, Matt, any other uh, recommendations for folks that want to get in touch with, uh, the, you know, the most active contributors uh, uh, in the protocol? Like if you're an LRT builder, for example, and you're thinking about launching a pool and you are thinking about how to shape that liquidity, um, how can they get in touch or who should they speak with? Yeah, thank you. Uh, I mean, you could reach out to us. We have, um, we have our marketing website. We have our official Twitter account. Um, you could find me at Doc of Steel on Twitter as well. Um, a good other place to start is the Maverick Discord where you will find links to this via our website or Twitter um, we have an integrations channel. Uh, you can also directly ping members of the core community there. Um, we would love, you know, to talk to you more about launching your token on Maverick. Uh, we're very fortunate to benefit from a close relationship with Token Bryce, um, who is advisor to Maverick uh, and has also uh, offers a lot of consultation to projects about how to shape their liquidity with Maverick. So he understands the tools really well, um, and he's been giving a lot, gives a lot of input to. Uh, projects as they choose how to kind of shape their liquidity form their boosted positions direct their incentives so yeah we have we have support standing by if uh people are interested in finding out how to explore maverick uh we're recording live episodes of the edge podcast here with uh up and coming builders and uh one of those that we're really delighted to have here today is from uh flat money so we're going to talk here with Ermin, who is the uh, co-founder of Flat Money, uh, and I, I would love to just kick off Ermin with, uh, "What is a flat coin?" Like, uh, if someone asked me, "What is flat money?" I just say, "Oh, it's a flat coin project," and then they stare at me blankly and are like, "What the hell is a flat coin?" Yeah, that's a great question, and, and it's still early stage of of, of flat coins, um, and, and most people are familiar with stable coins, right? Um, and, and that tends to today be used as kind of the unit account, the medium of exchange, particularly with crypto natives. Um, but at Flat Money, we saw some real kind of problems and issues there. And at the end of the day, what we're talking about are on-chain US dollars. And, and it's like, well, are we creating new forms of internet money, of, of on-chain money? And, and you know, why does it necessarily need to be back to US dollars? And is that even the, the best thing that, that we kind of want going forward and, and longer term? Uh, obviously, you know, in recent years, there's been, you know, a lot of uh, issues and concerns around inflation. Uh, but not only that, but uh, the stable coins that have taken off uh, are, the, are the centralized ones or the fiat backed stable coins. So, you know, there, there's money in, you know, spread across banks, across uh, different jurisdictions, depending on the, on the stable coin. And we've seen even with one bank failure, as, uh, failure, as we've seen with USDC, uh, it just creates uh, contagion. It creates a DPEG in USDC, as we saw last year. And we just thought, well, we're, this is kind of DeFi. You know, where are we actually going? What are we actually doing here? Does it make sense that, you know, if there's a bank run on a single bank, that uh, there's a DPEG on, on a major um, asset that's not only, you know, used for exchange um, with DeFi data, but it's actually integrated deep into DeFi. Uh, more and more protocols nowadays are, are integrating stable coins into their protocols because they don't want the volatility of ETH. Um, you know, if we were to rewind back, back to say ICO days or just post ICO boom, 
Um, a lot of protocols were using ETH. ETH was money. ETH was being used, you know, to raise to raise money for projects. ETH was being integrated into into DApps, but the volatility was just too high. And even for decentralized stable coins like MakerDAO, it was just you know minted with ETH, but the volatility meant that uh, you know in the downturn things weren't so good. Uh, if you're if you're minting Dai, you're at risk of liquidation, and then the market gap, cap just starts to drop. So we're seeing now integration of real world assets with MakerDAO's Dai. Uh, and there's a whole, you know, skew of things that goes underneath that. And and really, what we're doing is we we're kind of just bringing tradfi on chain. And the question is, what are we, you know, again, what are we doing here? Um, so at Flat Money, we saw an opportunity um, to to build a flat coin, and the term flat coin just means flat purchasing power over time, which means it's inflation resistant. So if your cup of coffee costs you, you know, one, you know, one flat coin today, in 10 years time, it should be no more than one flat coin. This sh- it should be inflation resistant or it can be an inflation. So flat money, we don't necessarily track a specific CPI, like a US CPI. And it's, that's very, you know, still US centric, right? Uh, we want to create uh, on-chain yield that's kind of native and sustainable long-term. And we don't want exposure to any legacy financial systems to TradFi uh, we don't want exposure to these traditional stable coins. So we just back it with staked ETH. Uh, so we're using Rocket Pool ETH um, to back it. It's 100% uh, capitalized. And we think that's the best um, on-chain uh, liquid staking derivative that we can use today. So that's where we are. So there, there's two sides to the design of uh, flat money. And th- this is what fascinated me when I first learned about it from from you and the team. Uh, can you try to like dumb this down for us? Like there is... Um, unit, which is the actual flat coin. And then we, we have this, this need for folks that want to, uh, you know, go long or trade with our ETH. Um, so, so yeah, for someone who's totally new to this, like how do they work together to, uh, create this, this flat coin? Yeah. So, 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 so the, so unit is the flat coin that we're building. So unit generates yield, right? And and like any yield product, you got to go, well, where is the yield coming from? And if you don't know where the yield is coming from, you are the yield. Uh, so, so we've just gone, okay, well, how can we generate you know, the best sustainable yield um, over time? And as, as you've seen, a lot of perps, ex- perps exchanges are popping up left, right, and center because people want to speculate on ETH. It's a volatile asset. You know, it, it doesn't necessarily make you know, you know, the best use of exchange, but it's good to, good to speculate on. And we've seen perps exchanges generate really great trading volumes. Um, and, and fees. So what we've done is we've taken a spin on the perps decks and we've created a leveraged long um, R ETH or staked ETH uh, perps market baked directly into the protocol. So what happens is the unit holders, the flat coin holders, they are the counterparty. So in other words, they are the short position um, to these long traders. So as a unit holder, you deposit R ETH and then you are the counterparty to the leveraged long traders and you are short R ETH. So it's a delta neutral position. The beauty of baking it all into the protocol, it means that you don't have to go to external, you know, exchanges like decentralized or centralized exchanges to 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 do that. And you don't have to pay them. You don't have to pay these exchanges. Um, if those traders get liquidated, you know, you don't see any of those fees. That all goes externally, goes out of the system. They are the intermediaries. So by baking it into the protocol, it means that uh, the the flat coin holders not only get the funding rate, which is you know very good at the moment. Um, in terms of yield, but you also get the trading fees, which we know is very are, are very great um, at the moment, especially for for perps exchanges. But also, like if the leverage traders get liquidated, that also comes in as yield uh, for units. So we just want to, and we've seen that this can actually uh, generate very sustainable yield over time. So that's how that's how unit generates the yield. Herman, there, there's a few ways that I, I've thought about getting involved here while we're still really early on and. Um, you know, one of those is I could deposit our ETH mint unit, the flat coin and, and start to use that. Uh, but can you kind of like, can you, uh, outline what, what are the, the few possibilities right now? Like are the, the, the most major ways that folks will use this? Um, like for example, if I mint unit, do I stake it potentially? Do I just use it again as, as like, you know, like a stable coin that I would use like USDC, um, what what would be your recommended ways to like kind of benefit most? And then also would love to love for you to call out um, more about the early depositor vault and and how that works. Yeah, sure. So so um, 
flat money unit is under audit right now with Sherlock. So we're just completing that audit. Uh, so we're looking to go live uh, uh, this March. Um, so yeah, how, how, to, how to get involved. So once the protocol is live, um, so there are kind of two options. So you can you can deposit your um, RAs and you can mint unit. So what that does is it just strips the volatility out of, you have no ETH volatility. Uh, you are earning the staking yield. Uh, you'll be earning the, the funding rate from the leverage traders, the other market. You'll be earning the trading fees every time they trade and liquidation fees. So you can just deposit and you don't need to restake or anything like that. It's just baked. All the yield is just baked into the protocol straight away. Um, but on the other side, if you, and I'm not familiar, you, you might know better than me. I'm not familiar with any uh, leverage perps markets that do liquid stake derivatives perps markets. So you're like stake to ETH. But we might be one of the first to do that. So what you can do is you can leverage long, um, not only get leverage long ETH exposure, but you can get leverage long staked ETH exposure, which means if you're earning, say, 3 to 4% on staked ETH, if you leverage long that, we can get a multiple of the, of the staking yield as well. Um, so they're, they're kind of the two um, sides that, that you can play once the protocol is live. Uh, do you think it's fair to like reframe a uh, unit, the, the flat coin, as like a tokenized basis trade as well? Like I'm, I'm thinking of it like that, but I'm, I'm sure there's, 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 probably, uh, there's probably more detail to draw upon there. But uh, anyways, what, it, would you say is that accurate? Yeah, you, you could you could say that. I mean, we've been running these basis trade um, strategies for a while now, and, and different types of delta neutral strategies, um, and we've actually tokenized them um, through through D Hedge and Taurus Finance as well. Um, and yeah, one advantage um, with this is that even if the if the basis yields come down, those trading fees that come from like perps markets exchanges, they're really significant as well. So we're just throwing that on top of the of the basis trade. Uh, one last question. Uh, you know, we're we're back in a bull run. We were just talking about this before we like uh, got started, and obviously we're all smiles. It's it's nice to see like number go up again. Uh, what does it mean for a builder like yourself? That's I think you've been building flat money for most of the this this prior bear market. Um, like, how do you leverage or harness that to grow flat money? Yeah, I mean we've 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 gone through the through the bear market. We've been building heavily through the bear market. I mean, you know, we we've got strong conviction, and, and the team has just been you know you know grinding hard. And, it, and it's funny when you see um you know protocols that just come out of nowhere, and you think, oh wow, they're just you know overnight success. But it, it usually never is. It just it just takes time. Um, so yeah, I mean this is a great opportunity. There's, uh, I mean for for flat money in particular, this is as good as it gets. Um, so this protocol, these these yields to to beat inflation um it it should it will beat inflation with the current with the current market rate this is the thing and there's a lot of competition for 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 these types of products but we want to do it in a way that's you know just minimum dependencies no dependencies to any external um protocols no tradfi no legacy financial systems just make a new on-chain primitive a new money that can actually last long term oh one more question <laughs> So you're currently built on base, and I think that makes a lot of sense given the fact that um, Brian Armstrong and Coinbase have like called out flat coins as like one, one of like the top projects they'd love to see more building. Um, I would imagine you're going to get a lot of support there. Uh, you know, obviously all of the the benefits of an L2 are going to be there. You know, fast transactions, cheap fees. Um, that said, do you envision expanding flat money like? near term you know well let's say once you're fully live in the coming months do you have any commitments already or plans to uh uh expand to like other l2s or or l1s yeah we've had a lot of interest um with this and, and of course it's all we have to think about you know how we want to scale and we want to launch first right we want to want to see you know what, what are the issues are we, are we making sure that we're solving the right problems here that we're creating the best money we can and once we really nail that model, and this is all at protocol level, once we really nail that, then then we can look to scale, yeah, across like that. Makes sense. Uh, well, I'm excited for the launch. Obviously, I'll stay tuned there. There is that early depositor vault that folks can learn more about, um, which is at flat dot money. Uh, any anything else you'd recommend for folks that want to get involved though with this like upcoming launch of the protocol or or just learn more about flat money? Yeah, yeah, just come to flat dot money. Uh, check out the early depositor vault and um, yeah we're launching very soon um, 
for anyone at the conference here. Uh, yeah, come check out our booth. Uh, we're just next to the Copy Lounge uh, near base. So yeah, come say hello. That's a good place to be. I, I definitely need a coffee. So anyways, thanks for joining us, Ehrman. Thanks. That's been great. I'm joined here by Jordan from Metronome and a few other projects we might allude to and talk about today. So um, Jordan, why don't we just kick off with, can you share a bit more about like your background and what you've been building with Metronome? Sure. I, so hi everyone. I'm Jordan Kruger. I am a co-founder of both Metronome and Vesper. And uh, to kind of uh, kick things off, I'll start with Vesper because Vesper, we launched in 2021 and it is a very easy to use yield aggregator. Uh, we have a number of assets on there, including a lot of um, LLCs, and we are deployed on three chains right now and looking to expand beyond that. Uh, it, it's a one-click solution where you can uh, choose which asset you want to burn yield on, and uh, that's it. You can kind of forget about it. So that launched in 2021 and a couple of years ago we launched our second DeFi protocol which is metronome uh, metronome is a multi-collateral multi-synthetic protocol and it is really uh innovative in the sense that we do have uh, a lot of use cases that are built off of metronome uh the biggest one being our smart farming which is a yield looping engine and with that, uh, you can loop through both Vesper and Metronome. And by doing so, you're able to achieve higher yields than you would just by depositing into Vesper. And so that is something that's really taking advantage of both of our products. So Jordan, uh, you've been in crypto, I think, for like over 10 years. And you've been building the space yeah. for nearly all that time. I'm very curious as like an OG uh what does this like sentiment momentum shift in crypto mean? Like you, you've seen uh, Bitcoin almost hit an all time high recently. Um, you've built through multiple bear markets now. So anyways, what does all of this mean that the shift for uh, metronome? You know, I think that the biggest thing when I look at where we are with the bull run, um, I always like to think of it in terms of mass adoption and what it will take in order to onboard more users onto crypto. And I think that the biggest thing that I would say right now is that um, we are really in need of creating tools that are going to enable users to feel safe in the actions they take, uh, but also ones that are very intuitive. Uh, and I think that that's really what's key as we think about how to build from here. Uh, my background is actually in bioinformatics and focusing on more of the personalized medicine. And I am really excited about just the opportunity to take some of that personalization that you see with personalized medicine and apply some of the similar ideas to crypto. I, I think that that is extremely important. And it's sort of what we're thinking about right now is what can we do to create a situation where users feel safe uh, but also creating something that is super efficient. I mean, I, I'm I'm in crypto, high build. I don't necessarily have the time that, to take for me personally. And so I want super efficient solutions. And I know that's how a lot of us are. In terms of building those super efficient solutions, I guess what has uh, the growth of L2s meant for a match along, like ZK Sync? Yeah, it, that is something that is really important to us and where we're seeing most of our growth right now. So we are uh, deployed on a couple of L2s currently, and uh, we are looking to expand to other L2s, ZK Sync being one of them. I think that there is a lot more opportunity for users to be able to try out products without feeling that they are losing a ton in gas fees. Um, and so it, we also take an approach of what we, what can we do to create a cross-chain, multi-chain solution? Uh, I think that right now there are still a lot of silos that exist within crypto and DeFi. And really want to think about it, at, once again, from the efficiency standpoint, of what can we do to create products that will uh, eliminate some of those silos and make it easier without having to 
do multiple transactions in order to participate in L2s and move even from L2 to L2. In terms of designing for more users to trickle into DeFi, to, to adopt to use these, these new products, if you had to pick one one thing, what's that like one thing that we're still missing or maybe that needs to be built? I really think of it in with the personalization. And I'm really excited about a lot of the AI innovation that has taken place. And the fact that we're starting to see a lot more AI integration within crypto. And what I would love to see is actually more of the AI for creating a very personal experience for providing recommendations that users can feel comfortable and giving them the opportunity to discover, essentially. Uh, I, I think that there is a huge opportunity there, and we're just starting to see what what will happen. Hey, Jordan, if folks want to follow you or learn more about the Metronome, what would you recommend? Yeah, we have um, our metronome.io is the website, and we have a Discord that is very active, uh, Telegram. Uh, so please join that. Also follow us on Twitter. I uh, And you can also follow me at Jordan J. Kruger on uh, Twitter. All right. Well, hey, thanks for joining us. It's like, it's so nice to see you in person. Um, Thanks to the team at ZK Sync for hosting us. And I'm actually fortunate here to have Shahar from the ZK Sync team. So we're going to talk a bit about ZK Sync uh, era, given that uh, it was launched in the middle of the bear market. It's one of the, you know, most used, uh, most popular Ethereum L2s. Uh, and so, yeah, I'd love to just talk a bit about like, what are your thoughts nowadays, Shahar, about why should we as DeFi users, why should builders build on ZK Sync era? First of all, thanks for having me. Stoked to be here with you. It's always good to Stoked see you to here in ETH Denver in this amazing booth. Um, why should DeFi users build on ZK Sync? It's a great question. I can answer it in the vein of why I actually joined CK Sync a couple of years ago. So I I wanted to join a place that, um, a little bit of a cliche, but w- when the space is at its most beautiful, this place thrives, right? And obviously one of the biggest problems at the time, uh, right now I think we consider it solved, was scaling Ethereum. But what does scaling Ethereum actually mean? It means not only scaling execution, sure, you could do that. You can spin up a centralized server and do the execution there and then post some root hash every once in a while on Ethereum. But no, you don't only want to scale Ethereum. You want to scale Ethereum's values as well, right? And to scale the computation um, is easy, but to scale the values, not many, not many places do that. And so that was what brought me here. As a DeFi user, decentralized finance, right? I want to go to a place that meets me where I'm at in terms of UX, right? Doesn't doesn't make me um, jump through hoops. But at the same time, I want it to be, the, the reason I'm here is is this blockchain revolution, right? I don't want to go on, on some place that does not extend the core of what started this space. And to me... Um, CK Sync era and all the hyperchains really extend not only computations, um, but also the values. So when I think about <clears throat> the question I get from a lot of listeners is, you know, when will whatever ETH L2 be decentralized or like which one is more decentralized? And so I think of I think of it as like a journey. Uh, you know, it's it's an ongoing mission. And so I'm wondering like, where are we in that journey with ZK sync? Like when do we get to like a maximally decentralized censorship resistant, um, L2, you know, one that we have nearly the same assurance uh, of having access to our, our, our tokens, our, our, our assets as we do on, uh, Ethereum mainnet. Yeah. A hundred percent. So, so that's another thing I'm excited about. Uh, we're relentless about, um, have you heard of the, the the different stages for rollups with the with the training wheel? If you can touch on that, actually, that's that's what I was hoping. Yeah, yeah. The, that uh, uh, the, those different phases, like what are those at a high level? Yeah, yeah, yeah. sure. So 
Um, basically, Vitalik had a blog post a couple of years ago um, um, enumerated the different stages that rollups are gonna are gonna be. Stage zero, uh, you have all the training wheels. Stage two, you're really inheriting the full security from Ethereum, right? Um, you and then you, you can really see right now if if people want to go and see where different rollups are at, uh, they can go to L2 Beat and they have a beautiful um, a beautiful little circle that shows you every single every single point of this um, stages. Here we're relentless about becoming a stage two rollup. At the same time, we do want to meet users where they're at. And so we, we talked just briefly before about hyperchains, right? Hyperchains, hyperchains would be used by different people for different purposes, right? And so there's going to be people who are going to build a hyperchain for a very high TVL activity. There's going to be people who are going to build a hyperchain just because they give, they want to give some trust uh, guarantees to their users, but not all the trust guarantees, right? And so what they want to do, do you, uh, do you, do you get where I'm going with this? Um, yeah. Yeah, keep going. I, I'm actually writing down a few notes for follow-up questions. Oh, nice. Okay, okay, okay. Um, so different users are going to want to inherit different aspects of Ethereum security. We are doing two things at the same time. We're relentless at inheriting the full security of Ethereum, extending or expending on no trust assumptions from Ethereum. At the same time, giving users on a hyperchain, on any hyperchain that they want to spin up, the ability to inherit different segments of security. So um, have you heard of Validium by any chance? I think it would be helpful for listeners to have you define that. Yeah, what, what does Validium refer to? Okay, okay. Can I give you the, the slightly longer? Uh, I have a, actually a good analogy I was thinking about on the oh, way yeah. here to the venue yesterday. Yeah, wh whatever would dumb it down for us. So I, I okay. like analogies. Okay, perfect. So um, uh, our hotel is about 10 minutes away um, on, a, on a scooter. And so I was scooting over here and I was feeling a little uncomfortable because I was not wearing a helmet. All right. And so, um, you know, so... I, but I still do that because I wanted to get to the venue. I had a thing here. Um, so I was just literally thinking about that. And my, my mind is on Validiums right now because um, uh, some of our first Validiums are going to be uh, in Main 8 soon. Um, I was thinking about that. Well, why am I uncomfortable? Well, I'm uncomfortable because I love my head. My head's important to me. I don't want to risk my head, right? And so I was just thinking about that. And I'm on a scooter. I really, really want to wear a helmet. If I'm riding a motorcycle, I'll never, ever not wear a helmet. Not that I ever ride motorcycles, but if I were. Um, why? Because my head's important to me. But if I'm running, if I'm walking, it would be kind of silly to wear a helmet. At all these different times, if I'm running, if I'm walking, if I'm riding a scooter, if I'm riding a motorcycle, I care about my head the same exact way. But I don't need the full security guarantees given to me from a helmet when I'm walking, right? There's different use cases, right? And so a validium lets you um, take some of the security guarantees, and I'll tell you exactly what it is in a second, uh, but not all of them, because for different use cases, for instance, gaming, when you want to save the chain state uh, a, a lot through your journey, through, through your advancing of the map, you don't need to use the theorem security every given time, right? You may want to use it at the end, but you want to have the flexibility as a builder to let your users not have to pay the full fees for Ethereum for something they don't necessarily want. It's like, my wife insists that I wear a helmet when I'm on a scooter, and she's right. Uh, but she doesn't exist, uh, insist that I wear a helmet when I'm walking for now. So what's a Validium? Sorry for the long answer. Uh, so a Validium is, uh, is a layer two solution. It's like a roll-up, except it does not use Ethereum for data availability, right? And what does data availability give you? Data availability gives you the ability from the layer one to reconstruct the state of the layer two. So we're a roll-up, um, we're amazing now, but we become malicious, and then users from the layer one can just pick off where we left off. Um, and how can they do that? They can do that because we post the information, we make sure it is available on Ethereum, so user can reconstruct the chain state and, and kick off their own node. Does it make sense? It, it does, it does. And I, actually, I want to pivot to one last question though with you uh going back to 
uh, builders who are considering uh, building on ZK Sync. Maybe you could tell us more of the the questions that you're being asked when you're talking with, you know, these developers. Like, what what do they need to know to to uh, you know make the decision to commit to building on zk sync um you know there's a, a number of now like well established DeFi builders and, and other types of web3 applications and i think of um you've got mute which is like a native dex to zk sync sync swap uh, of course uh, we had the privilege to talk with them here at the conference uh, maverick uh gosh i'm forgetting if you oh vest we just talked yep, with vest yep, there they're launching soon as a perps uh, exchange. And then uh, there was lighter decks that I just spoke with um, in the past day. And, and so one of the things that I took away from a user perspective is uh, these like uh, more performant DeFi applications are coming, which is exciting. The, the core primitives that I wanted, the, you know, the lending, borrowing, you know, Dex AMM, you know, style of um, applications like that's all there, you know, it's and, and it's growing and I expect it to grow a lot more, you know, with the bull run and, and you know, um, just lot, all the excitement that that brings. But that said, it all starts with attracting the right builders. So anyways, how like how do you pitch ZK Sync nowadays to developers and uh, builders? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um all of these amazing uh, projects you, you've just uh, said, uh, they're not even counting in the, all the hyper chains we have, right? And so uh, actually in my role, I'm mostly talking to uh, hyper chain builders. And what makes me unbelievably excited is that I'm talking to people who are user obsessed, who are UX obsessed. And so something that literally just happened to me um, like a couple of days before ETH Denver, I'm talking to this hyperchain project that what they want to do is what they want to allow people bridging in from Ethereum or to already have an action in mind on their hyperchain, right? They're not happy with, I'm going to bridge from the Shahar address on Ethereum to the Shahar address on the hyperchain, and then I'm going to do the action. That's not good enough for them, right? They want me to already bridge with the action in mind that I'm going to do. And how... Amazing in that, that we can now enable people who are UX obsessed to bring this solution home. And so builders can just like plug and play uh, w with their apps, with their hyper chains uh, to meet their users where they're at, right? So, so that's, that's exciting to me. Um, uh, when I'm here pitching ZK Sync, for me, it's the only place that does not compromise on scale, on quality, and on Ethereum values, but at the same time can truly met, meet users where they're at and allow builders to build for their users. Yeah. I love it. Well, uh, congrats on all the progress. And uh, I'm, again, excited to just continue to see the next you know generation of applications building on ZK Sync. Um, Shahar, for folks that want to learn more about uh, about ZK Sync or, or maybe get in touch with you if they're interested in building and, and just want to learn more from, you know, an expert like yourself, uh, what would you recommend? Well, there's a ton of way to uh, get in touch with us. You can do everything from our official Twitter. Um, just look up ZK Sync and, and you'll see that. You can, go to, um, you can go to our website. We have unbelievable docs. We have tutorials. We have, um, we have really everything you want to, to get started. Um, to get start to get in touch with us, uh, if your builders were open, we want to hear from builders. So if you're a builder that has anything to say to us, we want to hear from you. We want to hear your problems. We want to hear how you want to solve problems for your users, and we want to bring it home and productize it. Right? Uh, ways to get in touch with us very easy. Uh, find us on Twitter, DM us, uh, find us on Discord. Um, anywhere is really perfect. Hey, thanks for joining me, dude. Good to see you. Great to see you, brother. And so uh, we're very fortunate here to be talking with uh, Riker, who is the founder of the uh, most popular uh, money market on ZK Sync. They're also live on Blast and Manta. And uh, I, th I think we were just checking, Riker, you guys are around like 230 or 40 million in turn yeah. deposits. So that's right. just congrats on that. I, I mean, it's, that's no small feat to attract a quarter of a billion dollars. Uh, 
And so I- I'd love for you just to share a bit more about uh, Zero Lend. Uh, so what's the journey been like as a, as a founder of, you know, one of the top dApps on ZK Sync? Yeah, um, thanks for giving the opportunity, first off, uh, to do this podcast. So great to uh, be here and, and share with your viewers as well, right? So, yeah, our journey has been, so we're a lending market, we're a money market on ZK Sync. We are the second largest dApp on uh, ZK Sync. Uh, we're the largest money market on ZK Sync right now in terms of TVL. Um, our journey has been like hustle, dude, you know. We started, I think, in July in 2023. With zero funding, uh, zero community, uh, zero TVL, maybe $100 of TVL. Um, but it's been a very steady growth and consistency since the last seven, eight months. So $0 in TVL became 200000 100000 million, 10 million, whatever. Um, so that's the journey. It's been very consistent, even in the ups and downs of the market. Um, and that's really it, yeah. Uh, given the competition among builders on ZK Sync and then other L2s and other L1s, how are you thinking to attract more liquidity and more users? Like, what can you do in terms of like new incentive design with Zero Lend? Yeah. So, how do you grow more TVL liquidity against com- competition? I think as a money market, which is what we are, uh, incentives and community are the two strongest things, right? Um, so we are always trying to find ways to create, you know, more incentives, uh, better APRs, those sort of things, right? But also our community, right? Our community is super strong. And I believe in crypto, if you don't have a strong community uh, as a crypto project, you don't have, irrespective of how much money or how much backing you have, you will not have as much traction as you would. Um, so the biggest reason why we grew, why we're growing so well is because we have a strong community as well. So these two things we want to hone in and do well. Um, and that's really it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you're a homegrown hero of ZK Sync. Uh, having these like new native protocols uh, are, are really important. Like all the other L2s I can think of, like uh, Arbitrum had Radiant Capital, it was really important to its growth, GMX as, as well. Uh, so it's really cool just to see a team like yours taking off and, and, you know, building its own new community. I I think it comes back actually to like users feel like they, they've missed out right on, on other protocols once they get to a certain size. And so, you know, you think about 250 million, you know, is impressive to me as an early ZK sync user, but I'm sure like, you know, the, the roadmap will take us to hopefully tens of billions, if not hundreds of billions uh, so I guess like, what are you focused on next? Uh, Cause we're, we're in a crypto bull run. It's an exciting time. You know, you're, you're a builder that, you know, doesn't have the, uh, the brutality of the bear market bearing down on you anymore. So I guess like, how are you thinking to, to harness like the, the energy of the crypto bull run? Yeah. So, I mean, Arbitrum and all the other L2s in the past, they had fantastic runs, uh, in the last bull run, right? And I think ZK Sync is is going to have its 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 time, uh, which is hopefully pretty soon. Um, and yeah, so we're excited because I think this growth is uh, the bull run is just going to help give us more growth in community TVL whatever. Um, but also, like we want to start solving newer problems, different problems besides just lending and borrowing. Like one of the things we're very excited about is under collateralized lending. Uh, like that's the holy grail when it comes to you know loans, undercollateralized, those sort of things, right? So we want to continue solving newer problems, but um, the gist of it is that right now, yeah, we um, we're going to continue growing with the market with zk sync, uh, growing our community uh, for the time being, short term, long term, solving more problems than what we have right now. So Riker, for folks that want to learn more about Zero Lend uh, or get in touch with the team or yeah. follow you, what would you recommend? So uh, our Discord is crazy. <laughs> so if you join our Discord, which is discord.gg slash Zero Lend, or you follow us on Twitter, uh, twitter.x.com uh, slash Zero Lend XYZ, uh, these are the socials. So that's the best way to reach out. Um, but do join our Discord. Our, our Discord is super fun. Uh, a great place to hang out and um, that's really it yeah 
Great to meet you. Uh, yeah. and, and we got to stay in touch. Uh, I'm excited that, again, I, I want to see like where you all progress here in the coming year. And, and, and I know uh, you, you've just got like a blockbuster start. So just yeah. congrats on that. <laughs> thank you for thank you for doing this with us, really. Yeah. <laughs> So we're first joined actually by our guest remotely, uh, Gua, who is the head of business development at SyncSwap. SyncSwap is uh, one of the original native DEXs that was built on uh, ZK Sync era. They remain, uh, I believe, one of the most popular apps if you measure it by TVL or, or trading volume. So anyways, Gua, great to meet you. Thanks for joining us. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you doing? Hi, everyone. Hi, D5 uh, yeah. Thanks for having me here. Thanks for calling in remotely here. Uh, so, hey, I gave a, a brief overview there of SyncSwap, but um, how would you describe the mission behind SyncSwap? Yeah, so SyncSwap uh, is a DEX built on CK Sync Layer 2 network. Um, so our focus is on our user experience. Um, so, I mean, SyncSwap is all about, we're trying to simplify DeFi trading for everyone. Um, the reason why that we built on CK Sync because it helped us to keep the fees low and it trade fast. Um, and as one of the top decks on CK Sync, uh, we launched our main lab right after uh, um, CK era, uh, CK Sync era uh, went live. And our, been, our focus has been trying to offer our users to have a smooth um, like trading experience, or uh, whether our users is new into DeFi or He's a like experienced trader. Um, so yeah, we SyncSwap have been building for building on this product for over then uh, over two years now, and we have been constantly improving and expanding our platform to try to better meet our community's needs. Awesome, Gua. Uh, given the momentum shift that we've seen. Uh, recently in crypto, I, uh, we almost reached new all-time highs for Bitcoin just yesterday. I think we're like we were like five thousand dollars shy of it. Uh, Bitcoin has reached all-time highs actually in all other fiat currencies, I believe. Um, Ether uh, hit around thirty-five hundred dollars. This is a huge shift uh, from what you've been building in the last few years. Uh, you know, to, uh, re to to add some context, zk sync era launched in the middle of the bear market. Uh, and so SyncSwap has been really building with, uh, you know, a less, a less uh, friendly sort of headwind uh, that we are, are used to experiencing uh, during crypto bear markets. So given the momentum shift, the sentiment shift, what does that mean for you and the team at SyncSwap? Um, yeah, actually it's not easy because we have been, we start building our product, um, at the start of, at the beginning of the bear market. And then we also launched during the market. We launched right after CK Sings went, uh, main led. Um, so yeah, it seems like we, we using Swap have been, it didn't have, uh, like any updates or not much updates, uh, since we launched. But what I can, like, uh, there's like lots of things happen behind. Uh, we have been working on our concentrated liquidity pool. Um, in, in short, like, explaining it in short, it is like a missing, a, a mixing the gist of using Uniswap V2, but with, uh, Uniswap v capital efficiency, which means for users, uh, you can get your ERC20 LP token, but without worry about the price range. Um, and your capital becomes more efficient, um, uh, than Uniswap V2. So for users, what was, um, I mean, what's for them is for users, they might not even realize that they are actually putting the LP in concentrated liquidity pool because they don't need to set the price range like Uniswap we feel. Um, yeah, this has been like what we have building so far. Um, our concentrated liquidity pool doesn't, uh, it doesn't rely on, um, automatic liquidity management and it does all the heavy lifting by automatically balancing the liquidity. Um, so it decided to be flexible and, uh, it has been, it has been like adjusting the pool's focus based on, based on what users need. 
Um, and we also, we also like rolling out the dynamic swap fees to help to cut down the impairment loss while the market is shaky. Um, yeah, this like something we have been working for over the last year, and then yeah, that that's what we have been building during the bear market. Well, given all of the competition among Ethereum L2s and uh, uh, newer high throughput L1s, I'm curious, what can you share about why SyncSwap uh, was originally built on ZK Sync era and, and why you continue uh, to build the protocol on ZK Sync era? Yeah, I think. Compared with other layer two, um, I think mean, I mean it's very common that for other layer two they share the same kind of same same benefit or same the upside, which is um, for all the layer two, uh, it's scalable, high uh, TPS, low gas fee. But the main reason why we choose we chose to build on CK Sync is because CK Sync's of the the native account attraction. What we, um, I think right now, lots of people like can, they maybe try, but lots of people may don't know. Uh, what CK Sync's offer regarding their, uh, native account instruction mean for lots of protocol that built on CK Sync, they can, um, uh, easy for users to onboard. Let's say, I think lots of protocol like, uh, SyncSwap, uh, like Mailed and other DeFi protocol, they have something called Paymaster, which means for users, if they, if they come to CG Sync, if they wanted to trade, do the swap, they can use other token rather than Ethereum to pay the gas fee. This is one of the kind of um, significant features that what other layer two can't offer. It's only on CG Sync. Um, yeah, I mean, that's kind of one of the reasons why we chose to build on CG Sync rather than not uh, rather than on other layer two. I appreciate that. And, uh, wow, just really nice to finally meet you or meet someone from the team. Uh, you know, I've, I've monitored all of the, the progress and success of sync swap since you guys launched. And, uh, yeah, just very excited for teams like sync swap that are, you know, new native DeFi protocols, you know, born on an L2 like ZK sync era. I think it's really exciting, you know, despite all of the attention, I think, uh, when we see like some of the OG DeFi protocols moving to these new L2s, it's, it's very promising to see these new innovative teams like SyncSwap. So, um, I, I want to leave with just one last bit of alpha. Uh, anything, anything else you can share that you think folks should know about SyncSwap? Maybe like what's one thing, if there's anything for someone to remember about SyncSwap, what's that one thing that you'd like them to, uh, to know? Um, yeah, even though you, you mentioned like to share one thing, but I will do very quickly for two. First thing is we are launching our version two very soon. The first, uh, regarding our version two, which is about the things that I mentioned just now about our concentrated liquidity pool. Um, and the other thing is about our paymaster version two, which kind of have a better user experience. User can like get refund for the uh, gas fee, uh, if things goes wrong. Um, that's the first thing I want to share that our version two is coming very soon. The other thing is, um, yeah, we have been working on lots of the, um, blue chip, uh, protocol on Ethereum, like, uh, Lido. We have been like in collaboration with Lido and Hostation. Uh, we just recently kind of launched the, um, like triple boost reward proof on SingSwap on CK Sing. And what I can share is like, People can uh, use this or everyone can expect that in the next couple of months, we will kind of roll out more such partnership. Um, yeah, I mean, stay tuned and really kind of excited. I like, hope everyone can try our version to concentrate a bit and our paymaster. And Gua, if we want to learn more about SyncSwap, what's the website we should go to? Um, Sync, um, so yeah, people can visit uh, syncswap.xyc. This is our website. Um, and also, I think our community is all on Discord. And if you have any question, any feedback, I mean, feel free to come over and let me know. Uh, we are happy to like, listen to anyone's feedback. And so we're very grateful to be joined by the uh, founder and CEO of Vest. Uh, Vest is an up-and-coming perps exchange. We're going to talk about 
uh, what is the design behind it, how it differentiates. Uh, but we're joined here by Justin. Uh, so yeah, yeah, thanks for joining us. Justin, how you doing? Excited to be here. Excited to be here. Awesome. Oh, it's on. Yeah. Oh, there we go. It's on. Um, but yeah, no, great to see you, dude. Uh, one thing, uh, there's just so many teams now building on ZK Sync and, and I'm, I've heard of the Vest name before, so I'm, I'm delighted to say I'm genuinely here to learn about Vest today so uh, I can learn al- along with our, our listeners. Yeah. Justin, uh, why don't you just give us the elevator pitch on Vest? Like, what, what's the mission behind building uh, Vest? Yeah. So uh, at Vest, we're a team of former BlackRock, AQR, Palantir, Robinhood, Meta, and we're on a mission to rebuild finance to be entirely trustless and transparent. So the end vision is to actually rebuild all of the TradFi's financial products into their trustless counterpart and cross-margin them into one efficient DeFi ecosystem. So uh, we're starting off with perps. What makes uh, Vest very unique is our risk engine, which ultimately enables liquidity on any market without compromising risk for LPs or counterparties. Uh, If you're familiar with perp dexes, uh, essentially there's a spectrum of uh, pricing and ca- high capital efficiency and high risk of insolvency. So if you're familiar with, like on one end of the spectrum, you have very bad pricing, but solvency is guaranteed. And on the other se- end of the spectrum, you have high capital efficiency, but solvency is not guaranteed. On this spectrum, you have very bad pricing. I don't want to drop names, but these include uh, automated market makers, uh, Oracle-based perps with fixed fees. And on the other side, you have uh, generally order books, virtual automated market makers. And the problem with this side is that every three to four weeks, there's some major uh, collapse or some insolvency risk. Uh, I mean, I don't know when this is getting aired, but three weeks ago, there was Drift ROB. Uh, in January, there was the synthetics exploit. In December, there was a big Mexi exploit. And then in November, there's something with UIDX. So I, I think if you really want to get large institutional inflows in, you need to guarantee the solvency aspect. So the part of VEST is that uh, solvency is actually secured with math and not by manual trust or operation. Uh, so we, Justin, with VEST, yeah. some of the benefits you just mentioned, is this a result of like a new design or some sort of like innovation in that design? Or is it also due to the fact that you're building on ZK Sync? Like uh, I'm, I'm curious, like, yeah, 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 how do you yeah. differentiate from like some of these existing perps exchanges on other L2s and L1s? Yeah, yeah. There's, uh, honestly, I think the design is completely novel. Um, I'll be very clear and explicit that, uh, so our background, uh, we were huge Delta neutral market makers across the Solana ecosystem. Uh, we were market making on Drift, Mango, Zero One, uh, Perp, uh, Perpetual Protocol, some virtual automated market makers here and there. And uh, we're very familiar with the design ecosystem. The ironic part is that all those, those DEXs I mentioned, they blew up within months of even us just setting up our systems. So we wanted to build something from the ground up, from scratch. Uh, this is all shaped by modern market-making techniques. And the key def- defining factor is that it's ac- actually academic literature. So Vest Labs, if you go to our website, uh, you'll see all of our public research shaped by academic literature. Uh, we have things from uh, using like a, c- a convex optimization to uh, make sure that liquidations are... Uh, efficient uh, to, to to things like uh, bandit funding rates, which is, uh, you know, in a, in a silly way, like a reinforcement type learning model applied to funding rates. Uh, so, so really, really cool things. The, the part that influences the design really is the academic literature and, and something that uh, people have been researching for many years. And I think uh, rather than using kind of arbitrary mechanisms to build out products, we do some things that have been battle tested and researched and, and heavily tested for many years, uh, especially things from TradFi, which happy to dive like in uh, if that's something of, of interest potentially. I don't know. I, I would love to go into that, but uh, yeah. why don't we first just lay out some of the, the basics of the price yeah. exchange? So um, what assets will be supported for trading? What trading pairs will be supported and uh, is there any sort of opportunity for liquidity providers with this like this new design? Yeah. So uh, from a, at a very high level, uh, we can support any asset uh, that has at least two months of historical data for us to forecast the volatility. So every single asset that you can think of on Binance, 300 markets available, 
as long as there's two months worth of data that we can accurately correlate the forecasting model for these assets, we can list no problem. So, uh, you know, within uh, probably like a month or two months of launching, we can have all 300 markets of finances, uh, like assets on Vest. Is there any chance that <clears throat> Vest will support some of the more like exotic, uh, DeFi native assets? Like I- I'm thinking of like a PT token by Pendle mm-hmm. Finance. Um, j- just thinking beyond like the scope of, you know, the blue chip tokens right. that we can expect to trade there, like, you know, like a Bitcoin ETH soul. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, a- a- any thoughts on that? Yeah, that was actually the original intention. Because I think if you want to make a trustless, quote unquote, permissionless exchange, you need a you know, from a philosophical standpoint, markets are just a way for people to express their beliefs. And if you really want to allow people to fully express their beliefs, you need to create as many efficient markets as possible. So uh, that was actually one of the main intentions of us doing. Our main focus right now, though, is just making the, the popular assets the most liquid and capital efficient venues right now. But in the future, we're like probably within like a month or two of launching. And by the way, when I say future, I mean very near term future. We move very fast. Uh, we'll probably be listing all the more exotic assets. Uh, these will be an uh, isolated like, margin like type, uh, whereas the blue chips will be uncrossed. But uh, we'll be able to list uh, more so of, you know, I think recently we see a lot of uh, hype and attention go into long tail assets, uh, pre-launch tokens, things like that. We'll be able to tackle that as well. So we're in a bull run. Uh, yeah. So we, we, that's <laughs> been clarified while we've been here at ETH Denver. Yeah, uh, Bitcoin almost hit a new all-time high. I th- what is it now? Like 63? 62? Is that like 63, 64? It's at wow. 62 today, 62,000. Wow. And then I think uh, Ether hit like 3,500. Sol was at like $130 yesterday. So anyways, it's, it's a good time. Yeah. What does that mean for you as a builder? Uh, like you've been building really the, the bulk of this has been built during the bear market. Yeah, I guess like, how do you think about harnessing the bull run to grow best? Yeah. Um, so for us, like, like, you know, typically like people, like we haven't, like people are saying like Bitcoin 63, Bitcoin 62. Uh, for us, it's the same because uh, we've been in it for a very long time and we haven't really noticed anything different. If anything, we just see more people here at these events. Uh, we're still head first, head down, focused on building. Uh, like our path hasn't really strayed. Uh, one thing I want to I want to make sure and I want to like clearly differentiate is that we, this is a five to ten year timeline project for us. Uh, this is something we see ourselves dedicating our lives to, or, or a big part of our life to do it. So, all this I think like like the belief to take advantage of short term speculation, drop an airdrop, do all these points and and, and things. Um, I think it's you know for some projects it's a great time to take advantage of that. But for us, we're in it for the long run. And we see ourselves, like, if you really want to get capital inflows in, you need to make sure that you're building something that solves a real core problem and prioritizes the safety and custody of user funds first. I think in 2021, we saw a lot of people, uh, like, try to take advantage of the bull run. They, they raised money from these really great investors. They launched these arbitrary perp dexes with uh, weird pricing mechanisms, and they blew up three months later. And I think unless we take the time to say, look, like, we can take advantage of all these bull runs first, but it's just going to be completely cyclical. Until we do something, you know, and build something that will last for multiple cycles, that's when crypto is going to grow. And we're going to get more institutional inflows that way. Uh, one last question. So yeah. there's a tweet from uh, the Vest Exchange handle on Twitter. So this says... Um, Vest Endgame, fully composable, cross margin ecosystem. I'm wondering if you can kind of, you know, dumb down what that will mean for us as DeFi users, a fully composable, cross margin ecosystem. And maybe more specifically, like, what would you like to see built adjacent to Vest? Like, I, I immediately thought of, like, maybe Vault strategies that folks yeah. could be building in the future, yeah. like a Delta Neutral yeah. type of Vault. But anyways, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so so as I mentioned before, the end vision is really to rebuild uh, every single financial product into their trust as counterpart. The really cool thing about Vest, and this is the beauty of Vest, is that we're able to credit risk and calculate the exact amount of capital we need to make sure that the entire exchange and system runs smoothly. So let's say in a perp stex, uh, we realize that we have more capital than needed. We can con- distribute this capital to something that is less liquid, like a borrow lending protocol. 
So one of the really cool things is that uh, you can use your perps position as collateral for a loan and vice versa. You can use your uh, LP position in a perps exchange as collateral for a loan or uh, it's open a long position and you kind of create these cyclical ways to to trade and speculate. Um, so it, it's sort of like a prime brokerage model. Uh, this was something that has been our mission since day one. Uh, I myself am very, very well versed in financial history. So look at the 1MDB Malaysia crisis, 2012 LIBOR crisis, Argentina financial crisis, which by the way is one of the reasons why we love ZK Sing so much because of the work that they do in Argentina. It's, it's really amazing. Our end vision really is to rebuild options, bar lending, perps, any kind of leverage product, financial instruments, traditional futures into their trust as counterpart and make it as extremely capital efficient as possible. The problem with DeFi right now is that liquidity is very fragmented. And the way that uh, if you want to trade on DYDX, your capital is strictly set on staying in DYDX. Can't take the capital to a compound unless you withdraw and deposit into compound separately. Uh, this is something that uh, if you're familiar with Alliance DAO, they're looking for something. Uh, this is a problem that they've been looking to solve for, for a while. Uh, so hopefully we're the first to, to solve it in this space. So, so interesting. So um, for folks that want to learn more about Vest Exchange, um, I want to remind them then that they should go uh, follow Vest Exchange on Twitter. They can follow you at, you have like the greatest handle. It's Perp V2. I, I don't know how you got that. Uh, and, uh, uh, also, Justin, um, the website is vest.exchange, but um, any final bit of advice or recommendation for folks that want to get involved with Vest or learn more about Vest? Yeah. Um, so perhaps some advice. Uh, I know we're entering a bull market and I think things are getting very exciting. Some advice would be to, at the very least, whatever you're trading on, uh, learn the basics of, of how that is being traded because I can tell you there are many exchanges out there um, that still have very high risks of insolvency. And whether you trade on Vest, whether you trade on some other perp text, the, the thing I want customers to do or users to do is just make sure that there's safety, the, 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 their funds are safe and, and secure um, and they're not trading on some arbitrary perp text. If that's something of interest, I really highly recommend you guys to take a look at Vest. Uh, that's something that has been built from the ground up. Uh, we worked alongside really great market makers, uh, academic institutions, PhDs, professors on building this out. And I think it's something that was very novel and will change the, the landscape. So we're launching uh, very, very soon, like, like very, very soon. And uh, very excited to see how, how everyone will think about it. So, well, thanks for joining us, Justin, and, and good luck with the launch. Thank you. Appreciate it. And so I'm joined here by Vlad from Lighter. Um, we're going to learn about another team that is launching actually this week uh, on ZK Sync. But I'll, I'll let Vlad share more of the details here. So Vlad, may, maybe actually we could just kick off with a little bit more about, uh, you know, what is Lighter? What can we do as DeFi users on Lighter? Yeah. So with uh, Lighter, you know, our, our vision has always been, you know, can we build an exchange that has all the efficiencies of a centralized exchange, but also has the security and the fairness of uh, decentralized projects. And uh, we, um, we we made kind of our first attempt at that a year ago with launching um, a Lighter V1 as a smart contract on Arbitrum. And we've been working hard on kind of using ZK Snarks to make things really efficient. And so that's what we're launching now with uh, with with ZK Lighter, um, and would love to kind of get into the details. But at a very high level, you know, our mission is to kind of build an exchange that you can use for any any digital assets, whether it's spot or perps, and uh, you know, with kind of the performance as strong or stronger than centralized exchanges, while still having the security of Ethereum and kind of the fairness of you know being able to verify cryptographically that um, uh, that all participants are treated fairly. Uh, what are some of the ways that Lighter differentiates from other DeFi trading platforms. I, I know one one of the details I had looked up here was about verifiable matching. So if you can yeah. kind of dumb that down and anything else that's like key to understanding the the benefits of using Lighter. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and also just for a little bit of background, you know, our team um, we 
you know, I, I spent the first half of my career in uh, one finance, you know, Citadel, our early team doing HFT. So we kind of know how kind of, you know, TradFi works. And then we've been, uh, we have a bunch of cryptographers on our team and uh, kind of Ethereum uh, folks as well. So we kind of wanted to take all of those, um, you know, perspectives on, on building an exchange on the marketplace um, and figure out, you know, what's the main innovation that stops, um, you know, decentralized exchanges from being um, fully competitive with centralized ones, right? And so I think kind of the first thing you want is like self-custody, right? So your money isn't stolen. So that a lot of people have figured that out, right? And then the next thing you want is to make sure, okay, the trades that you that you think you did actually happen, right? That those trades are get settled on, um, ideally on Ethereum, right? So that others also have figured out, you know, DYDX and other folks. But ver the idea of verifiable matching is kind of going one step further. What you want is when you place an order, you want to know, you want to guarantee that your order will be processed fairly, right? And so, for example, like something like an AMM, right? An AMM is verifiable, right? What happens there, you can see exactly on chain what happened, but it doesn't actually do matching, right? So you could be subject to a sandwich attack or MEV, like when you send an order, you might not actually get filled at a price that would have been the fair price. Conversely, like other folks who build, you know, kind of hybrid, you know, exchanges that are partially centralized, partially decentralized, don't actually, they do matching, but it's not verifiable, right? So you send something to somewhere off chain, you, you have to trust that that off chain component matched your order with what was actually at the top of the book at the time. If they decide to match your order, you know, to match Citadel's order first, even though you were early first, you wouldn't even know that that happened, right? So for us, we kind of solved that problem where we have both, right? So it's very, it, it is actual matching and it's verifiable. Um, and of course, I mean, the hard part isn't just, can we solve this at all, but can we solve it in a way that's efficient, right? What's, that's uh, cheap and fast. Um, and that, that's what we've been working on for the past 18 months. So Vlad, when you go live uh, with this uh, ZK lighter, I, actually, first off, when is that going live? And then with ZK Lighter, what assets would we be able to trade? Right. So, uh, so ZK Lighter testnet is going live. Um, uh, you know, actually later today, uh, March first. Uh, so our our uh, white paper uh, is is um, is published now. The testnet will will go live, right? And so on. You know, on the testnet, um, you know, you could try out trading different kinds of assets and market makers will also be participating there um and there there'll be apis as well but once it goes live on mainnet ooh, ooh, uh that will happen in um kind of end, end of march uh for spot and um in in another month or two for perps and so for for spot it would be mostly kind of liquid token pairs uh and the idea is really like where this order book model what really shine is you can have like very, very tight spreads, right? Because market makers could run high frequency trading on the other side. So you could have spreads that are, you know, a 10th of a basis point or, or less than that. And, and so, you know, when the whole idea is that when market makers can trade with each other and can do thousands of orders a second, that's really great for the consumer because it's very tight spread. So really like the most liquid token pairs, um, the, um, it would also kind of enable us to launch a perps product later in the year that would kind of have, a lot of the markets that uh, you know exist on, on on places like Binance, but in a fully decentralized way. This is really cool to hear because I, I know that you know a chain like Solana has really owned this idea of creating like more performant trading platforms. And uh, you know, I knew <laughs> like just it takes time. You know, with zk sync scaling and and you know some of the other promising l2s in ethereum so it's it's really cool to see builders like yourself bringing that sort of background and experience to build trading platforms for you know folks like that were trading you know high frequency trading prior to this and and so on uh if folks want to learn more though about lighter uh where can they go and any recommended like steps for those that just want to get involved with the protocol um, now that it'll be live. Yeah. So, um, you know, in terms of a little bit on our architecture, you mentioned uh, Salon. I mean, we're obviously building on the Ethereum ecosystem. And so we're basically our innovation is kind of custom ZK circuits that run on top of that, that form this L3 kind of custom app chain that runs on top of 
ZK Sync era and uh, that rolls up to Ethereum. And yeah, to learn more, you know, our Twitter handle is lighter underscore XYZ. And um, the website is just uh, lighter.xyz. And um, if you go there later today, you'll see the announcement of the testnet and a link to the white paper, which, um, uh, you know, would would love folks to uh, take a look at as well. We're going to just record a very brief episode of the Edge podcast here with Itai from Dynamic, uh, which is like the auth zero of Web3. Yeah, so... Yeah. Anyways, if you can share a bit more, Itai, about like, what are you building? What's the mission? Um, how will we use it as crypto users? Yeah, absolutely. So thanks. That's, that's a, an accurate uh, description. Uh, to your point, the way to think about Dynamic is really everything that happens after you click login on a website. Our, our kind of, you know, our thesis is that if you open your phone in five years, every app on your phone is going to have a crypto component to it. You might not know it exists, but it's going to be the way kind of the rails are powered, ideally by, a, you know, something like ZK Sync uh, to transfer money, to transfer information, to transfer identity. And to do that, you really need an authentication system and then kind of an embedded wallet system. And that's what Dynamic provides. So the way to really think about Dynamic is that system that allows you to have crypto rails in the background uh, with either a Web3 experience, if you're creating a Web3 native experience in the forefront, or a Web2 experience where no one knows it's crypto, uh, and we can kind of support both. So recently, StarkNet launched their token and their governance, and so this is a big deal. We're, we're, we're all very excited for that. Uh, a part of that experience, I noticed when I was like logging in, connecting wallets, claiming some tokens, you know, considering whether I should delegate and vote in yeah. governance. Um, a part of that experience was was dynamic. So I, I guess, like, can we expect dynamic in, you know, all the other sort of future, you know, governance platforms and DeFi applications or what other sorts of uh, use cases, like, would, would you predict um, we will see with dynamic? Yeah, absolutely. So that's a phenomenal example, right? So that's a very crypto native example where someone would go in and they would connect their EVM wallet and then they would connect their uh, Starcoin net wallet. They would link them together and then that will help them claim tokens uh, for the airdrop, right? So that is a very crypto native experience. We also see that with uh, DEX exchanges like Lighter.xyz or, um, you know, or uh, C3, uh, which is on Algorand. But then what we're starting to also see is folks move from just Web3 to Web 2.5 or Web 2, meaning sound.xyz, which uses Dynamic, you gets lets you log in with a wallet, but then lets you also log in with an email. Same with Pudgy Penguins. If you go to their marketplace and click log in, uh, that's a Dynamic-powered experience that lets you log in with an email account and then a wallet. Um, and then you can start shifting to more Web 2 experiences, right? So if you go to Doodle's website, uh, they only let you log in with an email address, and then they generate a wallet for you in the background powered by Dynamic. Right, so that is kind of a third type of experience that we're trying to uh, that we're starting to see. Uh, one particular use case, or two particular use cases that I'm pretty bullish on, are tokenized assets, so real world assets coming online through a Maple Finance or an Ondo Finance, or uh, kind of uh, ways to buy uh, land online, like fa- Fabrica Land or Energy Online, like ja- Jasmine Energy, where you, as the end user, should not really care that it's crypto at all. Right, you, you should just log in with an email address or a Gmail or phone, and you should be able to access assets that you couldn't access before. And so there's this whole new category of apps that are being created where it's essentially crypto rails, but no conversation about crypto in the forefront. Uh, and that's that's something I'm super bullish on. You can see that across RWA, across um, kind of inter-border payments and, and a lot more. So while we've been here at the conference, uh, Bitcoin almost hit a new all-time high. I think it went up to 64000 and Ether was at like 3500 uh, Despite the fact that we hear builders like you say over and over again that, you know, uh, you know you're, you're buried, uh, you have your head buried building. Yep. You can't sit there and just pay attention to, to price. It does help. You know, it becomes like a tailwind effect where... We've got all these new users then coming into the space. We have like all this new attention. I guess like how are you thinking about just taking full advantage of this yeah. like upcoming bull run? It, it's actually ironic. It, it helps. Uh, I kind of wish it happened in a year. 
Um, and so, so, and the reason I say this is I think we're, we're a couple months away from having this full, very kind of effective crypto enabled stack. So auth, embedded wallets, account abstraction, on ramp, off ramp, and layer twos like ZK Sync kind of all combined into a single solution that a developer can use to build a full product on top of crypto without, again, ever knowing someone's crypto. But now with more developers coming in, folks need the solution today. They don't need it in six months. And those, and we're still cobbling that together. And so I'm, I'm very excited about kind of the bull market that's starting. I, I really hope it, it, it actually kind of folks give me a couple more months to build uh, before we get this huge uptick. Um, the cool thing, by the way, the, I think that the coolest thing about kind of, you know, what I hope is the next bull cycle is that it's really, I hope it's the last one. Right? I kind of hope that um, at that point, crypto is pretty much embedded in all applications and it's treated a little bit less like an industry and more like a set of tools that powers industries. Right, So I hope we start talking about it like we talk about the internet. There, there's no like internet conference or being bullish on the internet. You could, you, the last time that happened was the early 2000s uh, and now it's just a part of our life. So I kind of hope that this... This bull cycle is actually the last one in that category. You raced around just a few months ago, so congrats on that. I, I, I know before we got started, you had mentioned uh, you know raising money, I think initially and in, in, in launching in 2022, which uh, couldn't have been an easy time. So uh, really happy to hear talented builders like you are are, are raising money and, and uh, getting those rounds locked in so you can focus on building. Um, for folks that want to learn more about Dynamic, uh, or get in touch with you and the yeah. team, uh, what would you recommend? Yeah, so the, the easiest way, well, there are a couple couple ways. Those are the easiest ways to go to dynamic.xyz uh, and, and check out the docs. It's self-service. Uh, one of the cool things uh, at this conference is we have a booth and we had multiple builders walk up that we've never talked to in the past and they opened their phone and they showed a full product working with Dynamic. And so that's like a cool, as a founder, that's, that's, uh, that's uh, an awesome, I have stronger words, but we'll just use awesome for, for, for the podcast uh, experience. Uh, so dynamic.xyz, uh, I'm pretty active on Farcaster. Uh, so anyone going there, just Itai, I'm the only Itai there, which is, uh, I think, a strategic competitive advantage. So ITAI on Farcaster. Uh, follow us on Twitter, dynamic underscore XYZ. Or honestly, just walk up to our booth uh, in the next 24 hours or just reach out to us uh, on any of the channels. The cool one of, and sorry, I know this is a long monologue of an answer, but one of the coolest, I think one of the coolest things about our job is we get to see startups very early in their life cycle. Austin and Better Wallets is one of the first decisions you make. And so we get excited on a day to day basis by ideas that, you know, if you were to ask me 24 hours ago, I would say are not possible. And now there's someone working on them, right? It's anywhere, I think, over the last 24 hours, we heard of a kind of a church thinking about how to pay uh, contributors using wallets uh, to kind of, you know, inter, inter-country payments to kind of DeFi type stuff. And it's, it's pretty remarkable. So we kind of, that, that was a very long way of saying we love to talk to builders and kind of hear their use case and adapt dynamic to solve that. So uh, we're very kind of bullish on, please come talk to us through any of these channels. We'd love to have a conversation. Yeah, that's exciting to hear. You're you're like at the top of this like product development funnel. So so you're seeing all these like new ideas and, yeah. and, and probably able to discern, you know, again, like when we're starting to see that uptick in new ideas, new new apps, new protocols. That's right. That is very reassuring to hear. I'm glad I'm glad to hear you say that that, that you're seeing that. Um what well, Itai, great to meet you and and uh, congrats on all the progress. And uh, for what it's worth, I have used Dynamic. I didn't realize I had until you showed me the product demo and it, it is so smooth. It really does feel like, like I remember logging in with StarkNet the day they launched their token and, and thinking like, wow, like the UX is really getting that much better. Like I, I, and I guess now that's a credit to you guys with what I you're building with Dynamic. That. So anyways, congrats. Thank you. I appreciate that very much. Thanks for having me. Thanks everyone for tuning in. If you're a talented founder or developer, please consider reaching out to our team at fourthrevolution.capital. And for future episodes of the Edge podcast, please check out our link tree at edge underscore pod.